for those po na nagkaka problema pa rin sa audio please check your screen to uh, see yung mga troubleshooting um, options na pwede niyo pong gawin if ayo pa rin po after um, doing this troubleshooting uh, after troubleshooting pwede niyo pong i-check na lang yung live stream natin sa YouTube uh, ilalagay ko po sa chat box yung link Um, hello po. Yes po. Hello, nasa Zoom room ka na? Ayun. So, mag-start na po tayo uh, sa ating webinar. Um, again, if uh, meron, nakaka-problema pa rin po tayo sa audio, please, um, dinink ko po yung ating YouTube live stream sa, sa chat box. Pwede nyo pong i-check. Uh, pwede nyo pong pahinga na lang yung webinar natin doon. So, ayan. So, welcome again to our webinar on preparing and financing LGU COVID-19 recovery plans. So, um, ito lang po ba, a quick uh, overview lang on uh, flow ng program natin for this uh, webinar. First, we will have an introduction from 9 to 9.10. Um, 9, and then, may wakaroon tayo opening messages from 9.10 to 9.30. And then, yung discussion or yung lecture uh, proper from 9.30 to 11. And then, open forum and integration from 11 to 11.40. Presentation of certificates from 11.40 to 11.45 and finally for uh, closing remarks and final reminders for 11.45 to 12 a.m. So first part natin yung introduction. Um, yung about, just about the webinar lang po quickly. Um, this is 
again about recovery planning process, uh, financing the recovery plan implementation, and other related concerns. This is a uh, fir first in a series of CLRG webinars conducted in partnership with the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines. Um, but this actually yung second webinar na na ng CLRG this year. Last, uh, last month, we had a webinar for the uh, Sangguni Ang Kabataan on Youth Engagement and Decision Making. Uh, just a quick um, summary lang po ng profile ng participants. Um, this is based on um, yung registration natin. No? Um, yung nag-register po, we had uh, a total of 182 participants. Although sa ngayon, we have around um, over 70 participants. Hopefully, um, uh, do, uh, yung iba po na wala pa dito would join us later. Um, yung, yung mga nag-register po came from um, 28 different provinces from nine different organizations, sectors, and groups. So karamihan po ng ating participants ngayon from provincial LGU and CTO municipal LGUs. Um, those from provincial LGUs are mostly um, administrative staff, local legislative staff, uh, but we also have elective officials uh, um, like board, uh, board members and the vice governors, of course. And yung mga city municipal, mga taga city municipal LGU po natin are mostly uh, sanggunan secretary, um, councilors, vice mayors, mayors, uh, etc. So just a um, few webinar reminders po. Um, we are on mute mode. So to avoid background noises, lahat po ng participants, maliban po sa mga magsasalita, ay naka-mute. Um, and also, this webinar is being recorded for documentation purposes. So uh, now, magkaharon po tayo ng um, open, uh, uh, opening messages from um, our dean, Professor Dan Sagin. Um, although I think wala si dean ngayon, so Ma'am Selly. Si Alice daw ang magbibigay ng message. Uh, wala po si, ano ngayon? Wala pa po ata si Ma'am Alice. So... Uh, si, unahin natin si Vice Gov. Jerry Singson kung ready na. In behalf of the uh, LVGP. As uh, Vice Gov. Vice Gov. Jerry, nandito po ba? Hello, sir. Hello? Hello, sir. Naririnig po namin kayo, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi everyone. On behalf of the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines, I welcome all our participants to the first LGD, LGBT, UP, LRG, MCPAC webinar series. We acknowledge all our local officials from Governor Quirino, who will join us later. My colleagues at the LBGP, our supportive board members, mayors, vice mayors, and councillors. We are very grateful for the CLRG for co-hosting our event. Let us listen to our participants and benefit on our shared interest to design our respective recovery plans. Finally, as we listen to our short speakers, let us all heal and recover as one. Good morning, Joshua Yagina. Okay, maraming salamat po, Vice Governor Jerry. Uh, so, for the um, opening message. Uh, nandito na rin po ang aming director, Director Alice. Hi, ma'am. To give her opening message. Hi, ma'am. Um, 
Hey ma'am, wala pong audio. Okay, so ayo po ata ng audio ni Director Alice. Maybe later sa closing po natin, she can give na lang if na sort out na po yung ating audio issues, uh, her closing remarks. So right now, let's proceed na lang po muna sa ating um uh, webinar. So um, ngayon po magpo-proceed na po tayo sa discussion part. I would like to ask um former Vice Governor of uh, Tarlac Province, Ms. Pearl, uh, to uh, introduce our resource speakers for this webinar. Hi, Ms. Pearl. Hi, uh, Maki. Hello, po. Hi, um, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for turning it over to me. And uh, good morning po sa lahat ng participants. Uh, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Uh, thank you, Vice Governor Singson for representing the Vice Governor of the Philippines for your welcome remarks. And uh, I would like to thank you for uh, partnering with CLRG for this kind of webinar uh, entitled Preparing and Financing LGU COVID-19 Recovery Plan. So indeed, COVID-19, no? this pandemic has represented a lot of uh, disruption, a lot of challenges and vulnerabilities to different sectors in the world. and of course, that includes the local government units of the Philippines. So talking to the former colleagues that I had before in Vice Governor's League, in the Board Members League, and other councillors and different uh, LGU officials, uh, I know that uh, we have diverse participants now. There are reasons uh, that they keep on asking questions like, can we recover? Can we survive this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? How do we plan now that the needs are different? How do we make the recovery plans? And considering the limited resources that we have, how do we finance all of the plans that we have? So um, we have two speakers for today, for today's webinar. The first speaker would tackle the preparation of the recovery plan. And the second speaker would tackle the issue on the financing, financing the implementation. So uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, listen and to present to you our first speaker, uh, an expert on planning, our colleague from uh, UP School of Urban and Regional Planning, our uh, expert on planning uh, attorney, Mark Anthony Gamboa. Over to you, Mark. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'll start with uh, presenting how to prepare uh, a recovery plan. A recovery plan. So uh, I'll be talking about the process through which uh, local governments, which are considered actually as frontliners in our fight against COVID-19, could prepare a post-COVID-19 recovery plan. I will start with uh, some observations, which I would also consider as um, learning about COVID-19 using the perspective of an urban planner. Um, then I will proceed to discuss the recovery framework. Um, we, I'm, I'll, I'll discuss the recovery framework that uh, the uh, National Economic and Development Authority recently uh, crafted and approved by the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. Although that was approved prior to COVID-19, I will try to adapt that framework to, to make it uh, uh, suitable for post-recovery planning for COVID-19. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, okay. so uh, first we learned that uh, density is an issue when it comes to um, addressing COVID-19. You know? During the pandemic, we consider density bo both actually as a drawback and uh, an, as an asset. It's a two-edged sword, meaning it has features that could have favorable consequences to uh, our cities, to our uh, localities, but it can also have unfavorable consequences. On, on the one hand, the uh, overcrowding have uh, acceler accelerated the transmission of the virus. We have Metro Manila, Cebu City being the topmost areas where uh, COVID-19 cases, confirmed COVID-19 cases are present. 
On the other hand, the physical qualities of densely connected places can also make life amid social distancing more livable. Uh, for example, walkable and bikeable places would be able to ease the isolation of quarantines and uh, enable people without cars to move about. Next slide. Uh, another important uh, observation is that uh, physical and social distancing has now become the norm. Related, this is related to uh, density. The new norm requires that each of us practice physical and social distancing. But distancing is difficult for some types of neighborhoods. This is challenging for crowded housing and informal settlements. For some, the call to stay at home to ensure distancing is actually a call to hunger. As we have observed in several areas in the Philippines, this has resulted in loss of income, uh, loss of livelihood, with more and more families becoming uh, food insecure. We have learned that it is critical to have an integrated and multi-level arrangements to manage urban-rural flows across urban and rural areas. Next. Uh, when several areas in the Philippines were put under community quarantine, we saw challenges in terms of urban-rural flows of people, resources, goods, and capital. For example, many of the workers in Metro Manila actually lived outside the Metro Manila, so they had to sacrifice their source of livelihood as it became more difficult for them to move from their place of residence to their place of work. We also saw how uh, supply chain of uh, essential goods and services was uh, cut, in, uh, resulting in um, several areas without access to essential goods. Next slide. Uh, the more important uh, observation that we have to take into consideration is actually the COVID-19 uh, resulted in differentiated impacts. Although recent surveys have shown that most of the Filipinos actually expect that their lives will uh, get worse within the next six to 12 months, we also that survey also showed that uh, a certain percentage actually expect that their lives will get better in the next uh, 12 months. So we see that uh, COVID-19 actually have, uh, has differentiated impact. A city is uh, diverse. No? Higher income households would have higher capacity to adapt to current uh, pandemic, while lower income households on the, uh, would, have more, would become more vulnerable to COVID-19. Next slide. Okay, so we have several initiatives and interventions in place to address the uh, effects of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we started with the declaration of state of calamity, uh, declaration of the state of public health emergency in March, and then uh, a few weeks after, or a few days after, uh, the, the Philippine Congress enacted Republic Act Number 11469, otherwise known as the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. Um, incidentally, uh, the law expires today, so we're waiting to, to have the Bayanihan to Heal or Bayanihan to Recover uh, as one act from Congress. No? Uh, the law recognized an urgent need to, among others, uh, undertake a program for recovery and rehabilitation, uh, including a social amel amelioration program and provision of safety nets to all affected persons. Another initiative was... Uh, the Balik Probinsya Bagong Pagasa program, which was institutionalized and formalized pursuant to an executive order issued by uh, our president, President uh, Rodrigo Duterte. So ba Balik Probinsya Bagong Pagasa program is also called by that document BP Square. So among the reasons stated uh, in that document is we have that program to reverse migration to the national capital region. Uh, next slide, please and other conge uh, congested metropolis. No? Specifically, the program geared towards uh, addressing Metro Manila's congested urban areas by encouraging people, uh, especially the informal settlers. I would like to highlight again uh, that uh, this uh, program encourages informal settlers uh, to return to their home provinces. But uh, it seems that this program is met with several challenges and it's now suspended uh, so that you'll be able to address the new phenomenon of uh, uh, stranded individuals, no, locally stranded individuals in Metro Manila. Next slide. We also have several um, 
initiatives to transform our uh, infrastructure. Next slide, please. Both the national government and local government have come up with initiatives to address uh, several infrastructure gaps, you know, uh, as we saw because of the effects of COVID-19. For instance, uh, two national government agencies, the Department of Transportation and the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority came up with uh, uh, a plan to transform EDSA, a circumferential highway that serves as the major thoroughfare of Metro Manila. The several non-government organizations, of course, have urged the government to promote um, the use of bicycles as a non-motorized alternative to our perennially clogged uh, traffic uh, highway. EDSA. But the government actually has been sending mixed signals to the public as to how we're going to um, uh, transform EDSA. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we also have now observed the phenomenon of locally stranded individuals. Um, and uh, because of uh, the, the, the prevalence of locally stranded individuals, we had to suspend the implementation of Balik Provincia uh, Bagong Pagasa program. Next slide. So um, we have seen varying proposals as uh, solutions, but my, my question really is, uh, what was the problem? It, it's actually more important to, to, to answer the question, what was the, the problem? Beyond being fixated towards uh, finding solutions to predetermined problems, planners and even sometimes policymakers have the tendency to, to come up with uh, uh, solutions that have been uh, implemented years ago, uh, expecting that that solution would be able to address the problem. And so beyond fixated, be, beyond being fixated towards finding solutions to those predetermined problems, so we should be emphasizing the dynamics that give rise to the desirable or undesirable uh, phenomena. For example, we have been faulting density as the reason for our ills in metropolitan Manila. But my question is, was density per se the problem? Or was it just the inefficiency of uh, density? We have also been faulting Filipinos for alleged lack of discipline. Our own president actually told Cebuanos that they lack discipline. Matitigas ang ulo. But uh, my question is, was the lack of discipline really the problem? Or was it the failure of our institutions to effectively put in place structures and systems in the first place? We also have been faulting our provincianos who, who flock to the metropolis, to Metro Manila, to work and settle. And of course, my question would be, would my, is migration to the city per se the problem? Or was it the failure on the part of our duty bearers to empower and ensure that our rights holders enjoy their right to the city? Next slide. So this, the, the resilience of the Philippine uh, um, local government territories has been tested by natural disasters. The Philippines is among the countries that is, being, is usually ravaged by uh, disasters. But, and because of that, the Philippines is one of the more established policy frameworks for promoting uh, climate and disaster risk resilience. But COVID-19 has put more difficult challenges to our local governments. We have seen how existing social and uh, spatial inequalities in cities uh, aggravated by the pandemic. The imposition of uh, quarantine, for example, has given us a new understanding uh, of uh, public space, mobility, density, appropriate infrastructure, adequate housing, and clean environment. Uh, these are consistent challenges that urban planners and even policymakers have been trying to, to address since time immemorial, but have been exacerbated by our current experience in COVID-19. But also I consider COVID-19 pandemic as a great opportunity for us to rethink our local government planning and do things differently. We have to seize this opportunity by adapting our planning models and approaches to transform our cities, our provinces, our municipalities, and our neighborhoods for the present and future generation. Next slide. The NDRM framework or the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Framework uses four DRRM aspects, prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, uh, 
and rehabilitation and recovery. Uh, I will focus on rehabilitation and recovery, although of course the, these four thematic areas have undefined uh, boundaries, which is an indication of course of uh, the importance of seamless transition from one point to another. So the expected outcome for rehabilitation and recovery is uh, the restoration and improvement of facilities, not just facilities, not just infrastructure, but also livelihood and living conditions and even organizational capacities of affected communities. So in that way, we're going to reduce disaster risks. And that is in accordance with the concept of, or the principle of uh, building back better. So the uh, NDRM framework provides a comprehensive, all hazards, multi-sectoral, interagency, and community-based approach to DRM. So that's the claim of our NDRM framework. We've been preparing local disaster risk reduction and management plans. Our provinces, our cities, our municipalities, and even our barangays have come up with their respective uh, local disaster risk reduction and management plan. Now, even if the, the uh, our law, Republic Act Number 10121, or the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act, recognizes biological hazards. Based on my cursory uh, review of uh, several local disaster risk reduction and management plan, uh, these plans have actually focused on just uh, geological and meteorological hazards, but never on biological hazards. So even if I mentioned earlier that uh, we have one of the most uh, complex or most uh, established I say uh, disaster risk reduction and management policies, we uh, fail to take into consideration the possibility of uh, uh, a biological hazard uh, resulting in disaster. So the framework lays down the broad uh, DRM goal of building safe, adaptive, and disaster resilient Filipino communities working towards sustainable development as well as the four uh, specific thematic areas with uh, specific goals. Now for the th thematic area, again, on disaster rehabilitation and recovery, which I will focus on for this talk, uh, has uh, the goal of uh, restoring and improving facilities, livelihood, living conditions, and uh, organizational capacities of affected communities, and to reduce disaster risk in accordance with the concept of uh, building back better principle. Uh, Post-disaster recovery is uh, defined by our documents or policies as the restoration and improvement, where appropriate, of facilities, livelihood, and living conditions, including efforts to reduce disaster risks. Or rehabilitation, on the other hand, is uh, ensuring the ability of affected communities and areas to restore their normal level of functioning by uh, reducing lively, uh, rebuilding livelihood and uh, damage infrastructures and increasing the community's organizational capacity. So uh, recovery and rehabilitation are, have similar uh, goals. Next slide. The uh, rehabilitation and recovery framework in the Philippines provided us with a pa paradigm shift. It, 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 it gives uh, equal emphasis to vulnerabilities and uh, capacities aside from hazard. It provided us opportunities for land use planning to be promoted as a tool for disaster risk reduction. Now, this paradigm shift also involved the promotion of uh, non-structural and non-engineering measures, such as community-based disaster uh, preparedness and early warning, the use of inter indigenous knowledge and land use planning, encouraging the application of land use policies and land use planning and disaster risk management. Um, the Philippine National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management fr Framework is not only essential part of our development process, no? it is also an important com uh, component for us to be able to ensure that we move towards sustainable development and we are uh, able to achieve our commitment uh, to achieve sustainable development goals in 2030. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the recovery planning process I will talk about is based largely on the uh, recently approved uh, Disaster Rehabilitation and Recovery Planning Guide, which was prepared by NEDA and approved by the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. So the preparation of a post-disaster rehabilitation and reco recovery program involves, uh, involves four major uh, processes post-disaster needs assessment, rehabilitation and recovery programs formulation, approval, and the updating of the investment program. 
uh, a post-disaster needs assessment or PDMA involves a detailed sectoral and cross-sectoral assessment of damages and losses, impacts of disaster, and needs assessment based on field validation. Um, the results of this activity will actually inform the identification of strategic interventions and PPAs in the rehabilitation and recovery program formulation. In the case of the local government unit, the, the, the concerned local disaster risk reduction and management council can decide to conduct a PDMA when, this, when, uh, when the disaster is confined to only a few localities. But in our case where we have uh, COVID-19, which is uh, not confined to just a few localities, but is affecting the entire um, Philippines. So the, the framework in the Republic Act 10121 and its implementing rules and regulation, and even in the, the National Disaster Risk and uh, Reduction Management Framework, says that uh, the provincial DRMC takes charge when two or more component cities or municipalities are affected, while the municipality or city DRMC um, decides when two or more barangays are affected. This is usually the case for our natural disasters like landslides, flooding, epidemics, or uh, outbreaks. We've had epi epidemics before, like the uh, dengue epidemics, or dengue outbreak. We had the, the dengue out outbreak last year, which uh, recorded uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, infections. So the decision to come to to uh, to come up with a PDNA is actually based on the assessment of damage and impact of the disaster. So the Local Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office of the affected local government unit is the one that leads the conduct of the PDNA. But of course, you can ask uh, help, you know, assistance from the Office of Civil De Defense. And uh, for that to happen, you have to specifically request you know, the, the, the OCD to help you. Otherwise, the OCD won't know that you, 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 you need help. Uh, a PDNA is, uh, again, a document prepared by the LDRMO or the LDRIMO and is approved by the LDRIMC. The methodology for the conduct of PDNA um, is provided in the PDNA guidance notes of the Office of the Civil Defense. So the next uh, stage for the uh, recovery planning process is the program formulation specifically the rehabilitation and recovery programs. LGUs, local government units, through their, again, LDRIMCs, prepare their uh, local rehabilitation and recovery programs for disasters that are confined to their locality. Um, the triggers for program preparation are, of course, the usual local state of calamity declaration or a need for financial assistance from the national government. Um, LGUs can also prepare their respective uh, rehabilitation and recovery programs for large-scale large disasters like COVID-19, should they deem it necessary. Uh, these can serve as an input to the, uh, the formulation of the national level uh, post-COVID-19 uh, recovery and rehabilitation program. The next step is the approval of the program, you know, the, the rehabilitation and recovery programs. Uh, nationally coordinated rehabilitation and recovery programs are approved by the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, while the regional programs are approved by the RDMCs. The regional programs are submitted to NDRMC only if there are specific projects that require funding assistance from the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Fund. Consistent with the local government code, the uh, concerned uh, Sangunian of a local government unit that uh, drafts uh, a rehabilitation and recovery program uh, approves that said program. So should funding assistance from the national government be requested, the LDRIMC will submit uh, the Sangunian approved you know, local rehabilitation and recovery program to the NDRIMC through the regional Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. So it's important that the program formulated by the LDRIMC is approved by the local Sangunian. And uh, the final major stage is the updating of uh, the local investment program. The, the rehabilitation and recovery program should include an investment program which should be updated depending on the time frame of uh, the document. So um, 
a rehabilitation program could be a one-year rehabilitation and a recovery program. It could also be a three-year rehabilitation and recovery program. In the case, for example, of um, uh, Marawi City, uh, it's a long-term recovery program because uh, the, the issues there, that the issues that are involved there uh, are more complicated compared to just uh, natural disasters. Next slide. So the uh, recovery and rehabilitation program contains the following. You start with the background and the description of your affected areas. Uh, planning is uh, evidence-based, it's data-based. Uh, so you, you, uh, you start with uh, describing your affected areas. Usually we start with uh, topography, climate, natural resources, economic activities in relation to natural hazards, you know, in relation to natural disasters. But we're talking about COVID-19 here. So it is also important to emphasize social and demographic data in, a, in the description of your affected areas. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the differentiated effects and impacts of uh, COVID-19. It is very important to, to, to highlight that uh, aspect in the description of your affected areas. The next... Uh, Con the content is the description of the hazard event. In this case, we're going to describe COVID-19. Um, this is the first time that we're going to come up with uh, a recovery program for a pandemic. Uh, we had the pandemic in the 1918. We've had several pandemics in the 60s, 70s, but uh, in, the, in recent history, we're now going to come up with, this is the first time that we're going to come up with a rehabilitation recovery program for uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So the description of a ha hazard event uh, should also identify the immediate effects of uh, that hazard. I mentioned that uh, the virus is a hazard. It's not, it's a hazard does not automatically become a disaster. It only becomes a disaster because of the vulnerability exposure and uh, lack of adaptive capacity of uh, the areas. The next uh, content is the assessment of the effects of the disaster. Both physical and socioeconomic impacts of the disaster should be included in the assessment. The data for the, the assessment may also come from PDNA. That's the first uh, major stage of uh, recovery uh, planning process. Um, this uh, section uh, should highlight the human recovery needs which are outlined in the PDNA. So the next section of the, the recovery program or plan is the post-disaster rehabilitation and recovery framework. Um, we have a national post-disaster rehabilitation and recovery framework. We can just adapt it. Uh, we don't adopt it in total. We, we uh, localize it in terms of how, in, in, in consideration of uh, the effects of the disaster and the description of your affected areas. So the next section is uh, the identification of the objectives of the program. The rehabilitation and recovery program should provide achievable objectives within a specified time frame. The Umpong recovery program is not a wish list. It should be realistic. So the objective should be based on the expected outcomes from interventions for the sectors to be covered. For instance, if we're talking about COVID-19, we could identify as an objective the restoration, strengthening, and expansion of economic activities of affected communities because economic activities was, uh, were severely affected by COVID-19. Another possible objective would be the uh, increasing of uh, resilience and capacities of uh, communities in coping with future biological hazard events. So the next section would be the rehabilita rehabilitation and recovery strategies. So the rehabilitation recovery program should include strategies that will aid in the achievement of a desired outcome, outcome and goal. So the, uh, the strategies will tell us how to, to achieve our objectives, how to meet our objectives. So the, the strategies, therefore, should be consistent with the guiding principles uh, for the recovery and rehabilitation efforts. We have several uh, strategies that could, we could identify for COVID-19, for example, for uh, livelihood and business development, for agriculture and fisheries, housing and settlement, social services, and physical infrastructure. Those are actually the major action areas for recovery program uh, preparation. 
And the next section will be the targets. So it's the primary reference in determining uh, whether we're, we're moving forward or we're moving back, backward. So the, the PDNA should be the primary document that we should consider in determining what our targets would be for each uh, program and project uh, covered by our rehabilitation recovery uh, plan. The possible targets should also be disaggregated annually and by location. Another section would be the proposed land use framework. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm using the perspective of an, of an urban planner. So the, uh, the, the, the land use framework should guide the identification of locations for infrastructure and settlement sites and economic activities. Uh, it should be based on, unfortunately, many of the local government units don't have an updated comprehensive land use plan. So the, the proposed land use framework should be based on the, the, the updated the development and land use plan of the locality. Um, for uh, disasters with major physical impacts, it is possible, um, although COVID-19 is a biological hazard, we, we saw that uh, COVID-19 had uh, major physical impacts. So it is, it is also uh, important for us to, to revisit our land use framework. The next step, the, the next content would be financing and investment requirements. I won't talk uh, about that in detail because the, the, the next resource person will talk about financing the recovery program. So the other sections would be sector PPAs, the mechanism for monitoring and evaluation, and the, the communication strategy, which is also very important. Next slide. So the recent publication of UN Habitat and the World Health Organization argues that health and well-being must be integrated in spatial and structural planning. Uh, we've been doing comprehensive land use plans for decades now. We usually have a subsector there under the social development sector. We consider health, but uh, it seems that uh, what we're doing for health sector in terms of land use planning is not adequate. Really, it doesn't seem so. It is actually not adequate because we've seen how uh, our plans failed in the context of COVID-19. So I, I particularly like the question of uh, UN Habitat and World Health Organization. If the purpose of planning is not for human and planetary health, then what is it for? So the link between sustainable resource management and spatial planning have always been recognized. The fact is likewise uh, widely acknowledged that the spatial organization of our localities, our cities, provinces, municipalities, and even barangays and their infrastructure influence how we uh, respond to hazards. Next, next slide. So the next question is, uh, how, we, how are we going to transition to the new normal? Well, that, that, that transition to the new normal, or better still, I call it the smart, nor, smart normal, is actually the post-recovery and rehabilitation plan. How do we recover and how do we rehabilitate our uh, respective local territories? For us to be able to transition to the smart normal, it is important for us to have a paradigm shift that provides an alternative framework to rethink urbanization. Urbanization similar to density is a double-edged sword. And this framework should help us reimagine cities through the smart and sustainable lens. We should reimagine our local spaces through the smart and sustainable lens. Um, the problems that urban planning try to address are not simple problems. Uh, both in policy making and in urban planning, we consider that the problems that we, we tackle and we call them actually wicked problems. They are problems that are difficult to define. They are unpredictable. They defy rational decision making. So the challenge uh, for local governments to transition towards uh, sustainability, urban sustainability, not just urban sustainability, but more importantly, urban justice, uh, could be characterized as one of those wicked problems. Next slide. So I'll, I'll uh, emphasize three important principles in post-recovery and rehabilitation planning. I'll start with uh, build back better. I mentioned earlier that uh, the post-disaster recovery and rehabilitation plan has uh, 
five major action areas. So we'll start with livelihood and business development. Next slide. Next slide, please. I, I uh, used the photo of a jeepney here because until now, our uh, government has yet to decide when to, when to allow our traditional jeepneys to ply uh, our uh, streets. Uh, many actually argue that uh, the government was successful in making our jeepney drivers beggars. So it is important for us in terms of livelihood and business development. We saw how COVID-19 affected livelihood and business development. So it's important for us to come up with strategies that will be able to promote uh, the, a resilient livelihood and business development. So uh, we should consider, for example, value chain development of uh, economic activities at your locality. And uh, we should empower micro small and even barangay enterprises and we try to come up with policies and an environment that would make them uh, fully integrated into the value chain and as well as into the forward and backward linkages of their enterprises the next, next slide uh, the pandemic also has indicated that there will be challenges to our food supply chain so we've been promoting urban agriculture uh, but and uh, some localities actually argue that they don't have open spaces, but we've seen time and again that uh, space is not a problem uh, because of technology, vertical agriculture is now possible. Next slide. It is also important to address housing and settlement uh, issues. Now, we, we said earlier that uh, density could be boon or bane for uh, local development planning, but uh, we have to differentiate density and overcrowding. We said that density could also be, uh, could, could have uh, favorable consequences to a local government territory. Um, for strategies that relate to housing and settlement, it is important to take into consideration the uh, um, recommendation or, or the guidance that is given to us by the uh, National Human Settlement and Urban Development Framework, which uh, encourages local gov governments to design barangays and neighborhoods in terms of human scale and walkability. In, in that document, walkability means five minute walk. In other countries, it's 15 minutes. In the Philippines, it's just five minute walk. Next slide. Um, I'm showing here the photos of uh, Manila, uh, because I'm, I'm more familiar with the city of Manila. We've been uh, doing a project with the city of Manila since 2017 for uh, sustainable, healthy, and learning cities and neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, I am also using Manila because as uh, Mayor Moreno says, Manila is the window to, of the Philippines to the world. So uh, one of the policy pronouncements of uh, the city mayor was to establish uh, green spaces, not just open spaces, but green spaces in the city. And one of the challenges that they have to hurdle is that there's uh, actually no, there's very limited open space in the, in, in the, in the city. Much more, how are we going to come up with a green, uh, green spaces? Uh, considering the lack of uh, open spaces, the mayor of uh, Manila actually is uh, thinking of uh, vertical green spaces. He targets uh, around 2,000 hectares of green spaces in Manila. Uh, and then taking into consideration, of course, uh, the land area of Manila, it, it, is, uh, it needs innovation so that we'll be able to, to, to reach that target. Um, recently, the city government of Manila uh, enacted an ordinance that declared the Aroceros Forest Park as a per permanent forest park in, in the city. Uh, next slide. Walkability has also been uh, the buzzword because of COVID-19. So walkability, according to the National Urban Development and Housing Framework, is uh, the extent to which the built environment is friendly to people moving on foot in an area. So the, the framework proposes a benchmark for walkability at 400 meter radius. So 
uh, it is it, it assumes that Filipinos should walk up to 400 meters or a five minute walk. Next slide. Another important uh, action area for post-COVID rehabilitation and uh, recovery is the provision of social services. We've been promoting sanitation and hygiene, but it has that that the the sanitation and hygiene is very is difficult to attain in several areas in the Philippines. For example, for instance, in that photo, that's a coastal community with no source of uh, potable water, so they just use spring for their water supply needs. So it's difficult for us to be able to come up with a sanitation and hygiene program if we don't have infrastructure to support that sanitation and hygiene program. It is also important to develop our uh, health service system. Uh, when we talk about health, we don't only talk about physical health. It is also important to consider mental health, emotional health, and even spiritual health, be, uh, health and well-being. Next slide. So we started with the principle of building back better. I now proceed to the concept of recalibrating local development plans. Even the recovery framework that the NEDA prepared uh, and the policy pronouncements that our government has issued time and again, they, they they take into consideration the concept or the approach of whole of government and whole of society. Next slide, please. For the recalibration of local development planning, I'd like to use one of these uh, the, the tools that I uh, particularly like. Uh, it's called adaptive planning. So adaptive planning is used to deal with the uncertainty of our uh, future uh, it, it, it veers away from our emphasis on problem identification and solution to predetermined problems. Uh, adaptive planning rather emphasizes the understanding of the dynamics that give rise to that problem. So this means that adaptive planning has to move from prescriptive activity to a process of learning. Several documents have been issued by the national government and many of those actually are prescriptions to local government unit. Now, it is high time that we uh, engage local governments to a collaborative process. So it, it is important that the planning process follows a hybrid of bottom-up and top-bottom processes. Um, it is difficult for the national government to specifically identify programs and projects for a local government unit because the national government is not omniscient. Um, the top uh, bottom processes, uh, the top bottom bottom up processes, and the issue related to that could be summed up in the question that uh, if you want to know how the shoe fits, ask the person who is wearing it, ask the local government not the one who made it. We've seen several interventions by the national government that resulted in uh, difficulties to many of our uh, residents in Metro Manila. For example, uh, in terms of uh, the prohibition of uh, public transportation system, it appears that the more, those who have more in life have actually enjoyed uh, have actually better uh, chances of enjoying our facilities rather than those who are in, uh, usually uh, seen but uh, seldom heard. Um, for adaptive planning to promote sustainable urban uh, development, sustainable local development, we have to emphasize the concept of uh, the neighborhood in the context of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, coupled with Society 5.0 and the importance of big data and analytics and the attainment of the SDGs. Next slide, please. So we've been advocating for the use of the neighborhood unit or the neighborhood concept. In the Philippines, neighborhoods are loosely translated to mean as barangays. Uh, I mentioned the project that we've been implementing with the city of Manila. So the, the, the Philippine team, it's an actually an inter international collaborative project. The Philippine team argues that 
in some areas, barangays could be very well represent the concept of neighborhood, but in other uh, areas, characterizing barangays as neighborhoods is challenging. For example, in the case of uh, Batanga City, which is also our partner city, uh, there are uh, barangays that uh, have several neighborhoods within them. While in other cases, there are neighborhoods that transcend the physical and political boundaries of barangays. Take, for instance, the case of uh, the city of Manila, which is around 896 or 897, depending on the census data, uh, barangays. We have uh, barangays in the city of Manila that transcends the political boundaries. Uh, we have neighborhoods in the city of Manila that transcends the, the political boundaries of the barangay. So as to confuse, so as not to confuse you know, the, the concepts of neighborhoods and barangays, we at the Center for Neighborhood Studies uh, adopts the concept of a uh, neighborhood using the Filipino term kapit bahaya. The, the diagram shown on the screen was uh, copied from the National Urban Development and Housing Framework. It's a sample map of uh, the interrelationship of uh, neighborhoods, barangays, and districts. So the black circles represent walkable neighborhoods. We said 400 to 800 uh, meters in diameter with mixed use centers. Red circles represent districts formed by the groups of neighborhoods. So for example, in the city of Manila, uh, district would mean Tondo, Sampaloc. So the city of Manila has 14, depending on the document, 14 or 17 districts. So the red and black circles indicate that the concept of neighborhood can, def can be defined at multiple scales. We've been using the neighborhood concept in planning since the 1900s, but we have difficulty geographically defining the boundaries of that uh, concept, uh, the neighborhood concept. Um, since uh, we can define neighborhoods using multiple scales, uh, the selection of a specific neighborhood definition is important in terms of addressing the, con the, con uh, the problems of accessibility, urban design, uh, health, uh, providing health benefits in terms of accessibility of uh, basic services. Next slide. I would also like to emphasize the concept of uh, the SDGs and the uh, Industrial 4.0. So corollary to the planning that I proposed earlier called adaptive planning, uh, we, it also requires a shift in focus at spatial planning. So the challenge to the attainment of uh, the sustainable development goals, again, I would like to emphasize that the, the Philippines is committed to the attainment of the sustainable development goals in 2030. Uh, is could be leveraged uh, using the fourth industrial revolution uh, technologies. So the, the four IR is driven by technologies such as artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, the internet of things, virtual and augmented reality. The four IR, as I mentioned, could be and should be used by local government units to leverage, uh, to achieve the SDGs. Next slide. The concept of Society 5.0, on the other hand, is based on the idea that human society is moving into a fifth stage society, from hunting society, agrarian society, industrial society, information society. We are now in the, into the fifth stage, which is, as Japan calls it, super smart society. The, the goal of uh, so Society 5.0 is to create a human-centric society in which both economic development and resolution of societal challenges are achieved and people enjoy a high quality of life. So these are the, the various contexts that we have to deal with when we prepare our recovery and rehabilitation program. The, the process of uh, planning should not go back to the old normal. We cannot, we, we cannot go back to the old normal. Even before, post, uh, even before uh, COVID, we've been dealing with port industrial revolution and society 5.0 and sustainable development goals. But I don't think many local government units have actually taken, uh, taken into consideration the, the, the value of using 4IR and uh, society 5.0 in the preparation of their local development plans. And uh, some Fortunately, some uh, local government units have started uh, mainstreaming sustainable development goals in their um, local development plans. Next slide. 
Another concept that I would like to emphasize post, uh, for post-recovery and planning is the concept of big data. Uh, in planning, we're usually using spreadsheets. We would like to use census, uh, surveys, um, statistics, but for at the moment, the, those uh, types of data are not sufficient anymore. Big data has become a buzzword in, in urban and regional planning. Big data is used to describe a massive volume of both structured and unstructured data. Uh, big data could include the lived experiences of our uh, residents. So if you prepare a rehabil rehabilitation and recovery plan for our locality, we don't just ask how much is your income. We don't just has, ask uh, our uh, residents uh, the usual statistical questions that we ask when we prepare planning. We ask them their lived experience during the time of COVID and how that, that experience has changed because of COVID. Using that uh, data, we'll be able to come up with more responsive um, rehabilitation and recovery plan. Big data could potentially provide a clear data-driven and evidence-based policy making and urban planning decision making by improving accuracy and granularity of data, which your spreadsheets won't be able to give you. Next slide. So the next uh, and the last uh, uh, concept that I would like to, to emphasize in terms of rehabilitation and recovery is uh, the reconceptualization of spatial planning. If we are to promote responsible production and consumption, for example, if we are to promote the creation of smarter and sustainable cities, municipalities, barangays, provinces, or even neighborhoods, we cannot simply go back to our old normal, the old normal of urban planning. We have to move towards the better normal, the smarter normal. Uh, and that better normal, smart, smarter normal works within a space which uh, the MIT calls anti-disciplinary space. We have to promote anti-disciplinary anti space through civic citizen and civic science. Urban planning should not only move from uh, multidisciplinary, we usually uh, characterize urban planning as multidisciplinary. Uh, recently, we said that urban planning is transdisciplinary, and now we would want to characterize urban planning as anti-disciplinary. Um, a single disciplinary inquiry in urban planning is not sufficient anymore. Anti-disciplinary spaces simply do not fit into an, any existing academic discipline. Of course, our academicians would uh, argue otherwise. The anti-disciplinary space facilitates planning of complex adaptive systems. Our local territories are not uh, simple territories. They are complex adaptive systems. In tackling the multidimensional of, uh, for example, the issues of urban sustainability challenges, uh, it requires a balance between environmental protection measures, social cohesion, and the provision of justice. It is important for us to adopt a participatory and transparent, uh, transparent process. Um, in, you, uh, because of that, urban, uh, urban planning or local development planning requires shifting from a prescriptive activity to a process of learning. Now, how do we uh, transform urban planning into a process of learning. Uh, we, we've, we've, promote, we've been promoting participatory planning process, but sometimes that participatory planning process uh, is used simply to, to um, follow, to formally follow the processes that are required by the guidances and the, the guidebooks that the national government issues. But, we should take uh, the particip participatory process as a process of learning. Um, we co-learn with our uh, residents, with our stakeholders. Um, in also in a reconceptualization of spatial planning, uh, we have to take into consideration the concept of meta-design. 
at the neighborhood level. Meta design is a conceptual framework in which new forms of collaborative design can take place. The knowledge to understand, frame, and solve problems is not given. So when we, we uh, plan with our residents, we, we plan with our neighborhoods, we don't give them uh, the problems to solve. No? We co-learn, we co-create uh, solutions, we co-learn the problems and we co-create solutions together with our stakeholders. And uh, that knowledge in terms of uh, understanding, framing, and solving problems uh, evolves during the problem sol solving process. Meta design deals with uh, co-creation by enabling and activating collaborative processes. We should promote deliberative democracy at the planning process. Uh, another important uh, concept in relation to spatial planning is the approach to planning, which is called place-based approach or PBA. It's a systematic process, yet it is also a people-centric process to understand places. We understand places not just using statistics. We understand places by understanding and observing human behavior, patterns of the lives of our uh, uh, residents, what I call lived uh, experiences, and the socio-ecological relationships that occur within that uh, system. And that uh, understanding of uh, human behavior, patterns of urban life, uh, socio-ecological relationships inform the creation, innovation, and maintenance of our local spaces. Um, it is important to integrate both uh, technical knowledge and uh, local knowledge in planning. Gone are the days where the planners are the technical experts. The planners now are considered advocates, the planners are considered communicators, and the planners are considered facilitators instead of uh, uh, being just a technical expert on planning. It is uh, also important to plan across scales. A, a local government territory does not exist in a vacuum. Ever since the rationalizing the planning system was uh, introduced by Professor Cerote, we have been uh, advocating for the integration and linkages, both vertically and horizontally, of the several plans that uh, prepare that are prepared at various temporal and uh, spatial scales. Our local development plan, our local recovery and rehabilitation plan, for example, should be able to we should be able to link our plan to higher level plans. A local government unit does not exist in a vacuum. And finally, in terms of the reconceptualization of spatial planning, which is related to big data and analytics, is the uh, use of algorithms and artificial intelligence. Uh, perhaps it is high time that urban planning moves to the use of algorithmic based models, uh, but that is a challenge in terms of uh, the available uh, skills, knowledge, and the abilities at the local level because that requires a separate uh, um, skill, a set of skills, knowledge, and uh, abilities. Next slide, please. So I, I would like to end the, the presentation by, by, by through this quote. Things are not always what they seem. The first appearance deceives many. This, go back, uh, this uh, quote uh, goes back to my introduction where uh, we should uh, not be fixated on predetermined solutions. No? We should be able to identify solutions based on the real needs. No? We've, been we've, we've, we've been advocating uh, responsive planning uh, for several decades now, no? but it is high time that we make that a reality. So thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Mike, uh, for that uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, obviously COVID-19 has brought challenges in local government units, but it's also a chance to reflect, as you said, on what we need to accomplish. and. Uh, COVID-19, as you have discussed, an opportunity 
to rethink the way we plan and uh, we can move towards adaptive planning, which we will discuss more on uh, the integration later because uh, we will proceed to the next speaker. Or are we still going to have the break, uh, Maki? Yes, for a quick break lampo for five minutes. Yes. Um, Attorney Mark, uh, for your information, there will be a question and answer portion, but we will do that after the presentation of the second speaker. Thank you so much, uh, and I hope those uh, presentations, Maki, will be provided to the participants. Uh, there are messages that I've been receiving now that uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are very con important concepts that we really need to understand more, and I hope uh, we can provide those presentation to participants later. Is that possible? Yes, well, uh, we will send them the presentations after the webinar. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So let's proceed then to the next part. Okay, uh, so before we continue put to the second discussion, let's have a quick break lang for, uh, for five minutes. Thank you. 
Hi, Ms. Pearl. I think we can proceed now to our second discussion. Uh, thank you so much. So after we have heard the planning processes, context, and strategies that were discussed by Attorney Mark, we can now go to how to finance uh, the implementation of uh, the recovery plans in the local government units. And we have an expert from Department of Budget and Management. Again, another young expert uh, on that matter. Uh, we have Mr. Jan Aris Magaspak, who is the OIC Director of the Local Government and Regional Coordination Bureau. So let us again lend our ears to Jan. Jan, over to you. Hello, sir. Sir John. Uh, good morning, ma'am, and to everyone. Good morning. So today, yes, uh, I'll be presenting about the the uh, DBM issuances uh, for local government units relative to to uh, the coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic, or on how they they will fund the programs, projects, and activities addressing the, the COVID-19 situation. So the outline of my presentation will, will cover the policy guidelines issued by the, by the Department of Budget and Management for the local government units in guiding them on how to provide for funds for the programs, projects, and activities, or PPAs, as we call them in the, in the uh, budget to address the COVID-19 situation, and then the additional guidelines on the 20% development fund, the provisional guidelines on the preparation and approval of the annual investment programs of the local government units, and then the biennial grant to LGUs, the guidelines on the grant of hazard pay and special risk allowance and indicative uh, 2021 era, as well as the provisions pertaining to the, to the provision of funds for the COVID-19 PPAs under the 2021 budgets of the local government units. So before I proceed to my presentation, I would like to just briefly discuss the uh, mandate of the DBM under the Administrative Code of 1987. So the Department of Budget and Management is responsible for the efficient and sound utilization of government funds and revenues to effectively achieve the country's development objectives. 
So as you know, uh, the DBM prepares the budget of the national government. And for the local government units, these are the functions of the DBM related to LGUs. So we are involved in the preparation of the or promulgation of the budget operations manual for local government units to improve and systematize the methods, techniques, and procedures employed in budget operation, preparation, notarization, review, execution, and accountability. So this mandate of the DBM is uh, in pursuance of the local government code of 1991, specifically section 354. So this mandate is provided under the local government code. And then we are also in charge of the uh, release of the shares of local government units from the allocations to local government units as appropriated under the Pertinent General Appropriations Act. So that includes the internal revenue allotment, the shares of local government units in the utilization and development of the national wealth, shares in other national taxes, uh, subsidies to LGUs and all that. So where the DBM regional offices, they are also in charge of uh, reviewing the annual and supplemental budgets of uh, provinces and highly urbanized uh, cities. So what are the roles of the local government units in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and what are the legal basis? Under section 16 of the local government code of 1991, uh, every LGU is mandated to exercise the powers expressly granted those necessarily implied therefrom, as well as powers necessary, appropriate, or incidental for its efficient and effective governance, and those which uh, are essential to the promotion of the general welfare. Specific uh, functions and mandates of the local government units are provided under Section 17 of the Local Government Code of 1991. And most of the required uh, services in responding to the COVID-19 are supposed to be implemented by the local government units. I, as uh, uh, already mentioned by the previous speaker, the, the local government units play a very vital role in the, in the, in the, in the, in the government's fight against uh, COVID-19. So they are our uh, first line of defense in, in uh, eliminating the threat of COVID-19. So under Section 2, uh, another legal basis, uh, Section 2 of the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act of 2010, or RA number 10121, it is declared as the policy of the state to recognize and strengthen the capacities of LGUs and communities in mitigating and preparing for, responding to and recovering from the impact of disasters. And then with the, with the uh, issuance of Proclamation Number 929, placing the entire country under state of calamity, the, the proclamation sta uh, placing the country under state of calamity was uh, uh, issued to afford the national government as well as the local government units ample latitude to utilize appropriate funds in their disaster preparedness and response efforts to contain the spread of uh, COVID-19 and to continue to provide basic services to the affected population. So section three of the said proclamation enjoins all government agencies, including the local government units, to render full assistance to and cooperation with each other and mobilize the necessary resources to undertake critical, urgent and appropriate disaster response and uh, measures in a, time, in a timely manner to curtail and eliminate the threat of uh, COVID-19. So as you know, the Congress also enacted the Bayanihan Tuwil Laswan Act, which we will refer in this presentation as the Bayanihan Law. So that uh, law granted the President the power to adopt uh, various temporary emergency measures to respond to crisis brought about by the pandemic. So under Section 4G of the said law, the president was empowered to ensure that all LGUs are acting within the letter and the spirit of all the rules, regulations, and directives issued by the national government. So by uh, virtue of the said laws, the Department of Budget and Management has already issued several guidelines and issuances together with our partner agencies, specifically the Department of the Interior and Local Government, to guide the local government units in providing funds for the for the coronavirus disease 19 uh, situation. So the first guidelines that we issued is local budget circular number 124, 
dated March 26, uh, 2020. So when 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 the pandemic happened, uh, the budgets of the local government units have already been enacted and approved at the time. So while it is acknowledged that the budgets of the local government units for 2020 have already been enacted and approved, there are also uh, ways on how the local government units can affect changes in their respective approved annual budgets. So under Section 321 of the Local Government Code of 1991, or we will refer that law as the code in this presentation, and Article 417 of its implementing rules and regulations, the local government units are allowed to effect changes in their annual budgets through supplemental budgets, but under specified circumstances only. Another way of effecting changes in the annual budgets of the local government units is uh, provided under Section 336 and Article 454 of its implementing rules and regulations. So it allows the local government units to use the appropriated funds and savings to augment any item in the approved annual budget, subject to the conditions and requirements as prescribed under Section 336 of the law and Article 454 of its implementing rules and regulations. So in order to guide the local government units and consolidate all of these policies, the DBM issued local budget circular number 124. So that's the rationale of issuing that local budget circular. Basically, the policies and guidelines that we prescribed under local budget circular number 124 are mere reiteration of the, of the policies and guidelines as prescribed under the pertinent provisions of the local government code and its IRR including the Budget Operations Manual for Local Government Units as issued by the Department of Budget and Management. So consistent uh, with uh, Section 3 of uh, Proclamation Number 929, all provinces, cities, municipalities, including barangays, were strongly advised to provide funds for the implementation of, COVID, of uh, programs, projects, and activities to, uh, to, to, spread, to contain the spread of COVID-19 and to provide services to the affected population including the necessary support to frontline workers. So the funding requirements for such PPAs shall be charged against available and unencumbered local funds, including the respective local disaster risk reduction and management funds, subject to existing budgeting, accounting, and auditing laws, rules, and regulations. So for the, for the enactment of a supplemental budget, uh, what are the rules? Under Section 321 of the Code and uh, Article 417 of its IRR, and as further discussed under the Budget Operations Manual for Local Government Units, uh, the local government units may affect changes in their annual budgets under the following circumstances. Number one, when supported by funds actually available as certified by the local treasurer. So when can we say that the funds of the local government units are actually available? So these uh, funds actually available refer to the amount of money actually collected as certified by the local treasurer at any given point during the fiscal year, which is over and above the estimated income collection for that point in the year. Meaning, if the LGU projected, say, 100,000 collection, in, in the first quarter of this year, and then what was actually collected is 120,000. Then that one, that 20,000, which was not considered by the LGU when it prepared its annual budget, may be a source of a of fund to to enact a supplemental budget. So funds uh, are also deemed actually available when there are savings. So under Article 454 of the Implementing Rules and Regulations of the Local Government Code. Savings refer to portions or balances as of any given point in the fiscal year or any program or allotted appropriation which remain free of any obligation or encumbrance and which are still available after the satisfactory completion or unavoidable discontinuance or abandonment of the work, activity, or purpose for which the appropriation was originally authorized or which uh, result from an obligated compensation and related costs pertaining to vacant positions and leave of absence without pay. So in case there are savings generated by the local government units from its 2020 budget, then that can also be a funding source for a supplemental budget. Another instance when the LGU can enact a supplemental budget if, is if covered by a new revenue source. 
So revenue, new revenue source refers to uh, money measure not otherwise considered during the preparation and enactment of the annual budget. Such new measure include ordinance passed by the Sangonian during the fiscal year, but after the annual budget had already been enacted into law, which imposes new local taxes, charges, fees, fines, and penalties, or which raises existing local taxes, charges, fees, fines, or penalties. So kung mayroong mga bagong mga tax ordinance po or uh, ordinances imposing fees and charges which were not considered by the LGU when they were enacting their 2020 annual budget, the, the funds that may be generated from such tax or revenue generating measures may, may fund the supplemental budget. So another uh, new revenue source is when there are contributions or subsidies or grants from the national government or from government corporations or private entities which have not been included in the estimates of income which serve as basis for the annual budget of the local government units. So another, uh, uh, an example of this is the Bayanihan grant to, to the local government units which the DBM released in, in April of this year. So the Bayanihan grant was only released this year and it was not considered by the LGUs when they were preparing their 2020 annual budget. So it is considered as a new revenue source and therefore may be a funding source for a supplemental budget. So another instance when the LGUs can affect changes in their annual budgets is in times of public calamity such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So by way of budgetary realignment to set aside appropriations for the purchase of supplies and materials or the payment of services, which are exceptionally urgent or absolutely indispensable to prevent imminent danger to or loss of life or property in the jurisdiction of the LGU and in other areas declared in a state of calamity by the president. So this is provided under section 321 of the code and article 417 of its IRR as amended by administrative order number 47 issued by then president uh, uh, Fidel Marcos. So in such case that the LGUs will realign its budget for COVID-19 related programs and projects, the appropriation ordinance shall clearly indicate the following. Number one, the source of funds available for appropriations as certified under oath jointly by the local treasurer and the local accountant and attested by the local chief executive. The, the items of appropriations affected, so which are those uh, items in the budget that will be realigned and the reason for, for the change or realignment in the budget should be provided in the, in the appropriation ordinance to be enacted by the Sangunian. So if the local government unit is operating under a enacted budget, the local Sangunian shall not be allowed to enact an appropriation ordinance authorizing a supplemental budget. So this uh, policy is consistent with Section 323 of the code, which provides that no supplemental appropriation shall be passed in lieu of the annual budget. So if the LGU is operating on a enacted budget, it cannot uh, affect changes in its enacted budget which is considered as, is, uh, as its uh, operating annual budget pending the approval of the, of the real annual budget of the LGU. So in this case, uh, in as much as the annual budget of the LGU is yet to be enacted, the LGU may already reprogram the, the PPAs in its annual budget that is to be enacted. So may mga, may mga repercussions din po if the, uh, if the LGU is operating under the re-enacted budget. For example, since they are not allowed to pass a supplemental budget, they cannot also utilize the allocations from the Bayanihan grant to LGU. So that is one repercussion. If you are operating under a reluctant budget, then you have to expedite the, the passage and approval of that annual budget. So you can already pass a supplemental budget and enable you to utilize the Bayanihan grant. So that is just one example of the, of the repercussions. So another way of affecting changes in the annual budget is the use of savings and augmentation, which is provided under Section 336 of the Code and Article 454 of its Implementing Rules and Regulations. So under this provision of the Code, funds shall be available exclusively for the specific purpose for which they have been appropriated. The ordinance shall be passed authorizing any transfer of appropriations from one item to another. 
However, the local chief executive or the presiding officer of the Sangunian concern may, by ordinance, be authorized to augment any item in the approved annual budget for their respective offices from savings in other items within the same expense class of their respective appropriations. So to further guide the local government units on how to effect changes in their annual budgets with the use of savings and augmentation, we prescribe the specific policies that need to be adopted in cons consistent, of course, with the provisions of the local government code. So these are the specific policies that the LGUs need to, need to follow. Number one, the local chief executive being the head of the executive department or the presiding officer being the head of the legislative department of the LGU is authorized by ordinance. It is not an appropriation ordinance that gives the authority, but just in the form of, of, an, of an ordinance enacted by the Sangunian to use savings and augment items in the approved annual budget. So since what is required under the law is there should be an approved annual budget in case the LGU is operating under a re-enacted re budget, it cannot also affect changes in its annual budget using the mode of uh, using savings and augmentation under Section 336 and Article 454 of the local government rule. So the second uh, condition is the authority granted to the LCE or local chief executive or the presiding officer covers the augmentation of any item in the approved annual budget which upon implementation or subsequent evaluation of needed resources is determined to be deficient. And then the amount to augment the deficient item of appropriation must be sourced from savings. So the definition of savings is also provided under Article 454 of the implementing rules of the local, local government code. And finally, the items of, of appropriation to be augmented and that from which the savings would be derived are within the same expense class in the appropriations within the executive department in the case of the authority for the local chief executive or the legislative department in the case of the presiding officer. So in case uh, the PS is getting savings, Dapat yung pag-augmenta niya is also a PS item. For MOE, it should also be MOE. And for CEO, it's all, it should all be, all also be uh, CEO or capital outlay. So for the Local Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Fund. Uh, by the way, under the, local, under, the, under the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act of 2010, the local government units are required to allocate at less than 5% of their estimated uh, regular income to be set aside as a local disaster risk reduction and management fund. So the local disaster risk reduction and management fund of the local government units may also be used as a funding source or to, to fund the programs, projects, and activities of LGUs related to, to COVID-19. So in the local budget circular issued by the DBM, we also emphasize the need for coordination between the national government and the LGUs to ensure the full maximization of resources and complementation of the programs, projects, and activities at the different levels of uh, uh, government. And the local government units under Section 33 of the Local Government Code of 1991 are also mandated to perform cooperative undertakings with the other local government units. So if they are working closely hand in hand, uh, specifically the, the contiguous local government units, uh, they may be able to save more resources and implement their programs more efficiently because of that coordination. So the, the provision of funds for COVID-19, we just, we just made an emphasis in the, in the local budget circular that it should not result to non-compliance by the LGU concerned with the mandatory items of, of appropriation and other budgetary limitations as prescribed under the local government code and other applicable budgeting and accounting and auditing rules and regulations. So still, the disbursement of the funds of the LGU should still comply with the with the policies prescribed under the Government Procurement Act of uh, or Republic Act Number 9184. Although the Government Procurement Policy Board issued several guidelines already in order to somehow relax the guidelines in procurement, considering the present situation 
uh, brought about by the COVID-19. So you may just visit the, the the website of the GPTB for those policies and guidelines on procurement. So that's the the provision of funds for the COVID-19 issued for the local government units by virtue of local budget circular number 124. So the DBM also issued the additional guidelines or provisional guidelines on the utilization of the 20% of the annual internal revenue allotment, which we popularly known as the, or commonly known as the 20% development fund. The 20% development fund is a mandatory item of appropriation in the local government units. So all local government units are required to allocate no less than 20% of their annual internal revenue allotment for development projects. The development projects that may be implemented by the local government units were specified in the 2017 Joint Memorandum Circular issued by the DBM and the DILG. So these uh, programs and projects partake the nature of investments and capital expenditures. So they are mostly uh, infrastructure, motor vehicles, uh, heavy equipment, and all other capital intensive programs and projects. We did not include any program or project that, that uh, partake the nature of a soft project. But given the COVID-19 uh, situation, we issued the joint memorandum circular to provide the provisional guidelines to, to give the local government units greater leeway and flexibility in the utilization of their funds for COVID-19 related programs and projects and to also enable them, of course, to undertake critical, urgent, and appropriate disaster response and aid and measures to curtail and eliminate the COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. So these are the specific programs and projects that we included to the, to the allowable programs and projects that may be funded out of the 20% development fund of the local government units. Number one, the procurement of personal protective equipment the equipment, reagents, and kits for COVID-19 testing, medicines and vitamins, hospital equipment and supplies, disinfectants, sprayers, and other disinfecting supplies and uh, misting equipment, food, transportation, and accommodation expenses of medical or health workers and other LGU personnel directly involved in the implementation of COVID-19-related PPAs, food assistance and other relief goods for affected households, uh, expenses for the construction, repair, lease, or rental of uh, additional space or building to accommodate COVID-19 patients and persons under monitoring or investigation. Expenses for the operation of standalone mobile testing laboratories. Uh, expenses for the purchase or rental of tents or spaces as temporary shelters for the homeless. Expenses related to the training in the conduct of uh, COVID-19 testing and related trainings for the LGU personnel and other necessary COVID-19 related PPAs and expenses. So this uh, provision, this catch-all provision should not be interpreted to mean that we are giving uh, absolute leeway to the local government units. The programs and projects to be implemented by the local government units should still be related to COVID-19 related uh, PPAs and expenses. In addition to that uh, limitation, we also prescribe the expenditure items that allowed to be charged against the 20% development fund. So this uh, includes the, the uh, this, this uh, expenditure items include uh, PS expenditures like salaries, wages, overtime pay, and other personal benefits, including the payment of uh, COVID-19 hazard pay and COVID-19 special risk allowance. It cannot also charge the administrative expenses, the traveling expenses, whether domestic or foreign, uh, registration or participation fees in training, seminars or conferences, except of course, if the training is related to COVID-19 testing, which is authorized under the positive list or allowable list of programs and projects. The purchase of administrative uh, furniture uh, fixtures, equipment, and all administrative uh, appliances or equipment in the LGU, and maintenance or repair, including purchase of motor vehicles or motorcycles, other, other than those specified in the 2017 JMC. So, kung ambulance yan, then it, it can be charged against the 20% development fund. 
But if it is a motor vehicle to be used for administrative purposes, then you cannot charge it against the credit person development fund. Another guidelines issued by DBM is the provisional guidelines on the preparation and approval of the annual investment programs of the local government units. So the declaration of a state of public health emergency under proclamation number 929 or 921922, I mean, throughout the country and the implementation of uh, enhanced community quarantine in, in many areas in the country imposed restrictions on the mobility and physical interaction of the general public with the adoption of strict social distancing measures. So it has been reported to the DBM and to the DILG that many LDCs or local development councils and local Sangonians are not able to appropriately convene in order to prepare and approve the annual investment programs or the necessary supplemental investment programs of the respective LGUs under the circumstances. In this regard, since the local government units are at the forefront of implementing necessary measures to curtail and eliminate the threat of COVID-19, there was an urgency on the part of the DBM and the DILG to provide greater flexibility to the local government units to enable them to adequately and effectively respond to the crisis in a timely manner. So the DBM and the DILG issued the Joint Memorandum Circular to provide the provisional guidelines on the preparation and approval of the annual investment programs and supplemental investment programs of the LGUs. So these are the specific uh, provisions of the, of, the, of the JMC. All COVID-19 related programs and projects and, and expenses to be funded by the LGU should be part of the respective annual investment programs. That's the general rule. That's what we have been implementing for the past years, that whatever is to be funded out of the funds of the local government units or out of the subsidies uh, extended by the national government to the LGUs should have been part or should have been included in the annual investment programs of the local government units. So in case the COVID-19 related programs and projects of the local government units are not among those included in the approved annual investment program, the local development council shall prepare a supplemental investment program for the purpose to be implemented or to be approved by the local Sangunian. However, in view of the implementation of the enhanced community quarantine and the physical distancing measures, which uh, renders the local development council unable to convene to prepare the AIP or supplemental AIP, the COVID-19 related PPAs and expenses may still be funded by the LGO concern, provide, provided by the norm but that upon the normalization of the situation, the local development council shall, pre shall prepare the necessary AIP or supplemental investment program or programs to be approved by the local Sangonian. So this DOA was uh, intended to enable the local government units to defer, in the meantime, the preparation and approval of the annual investment program. Because as you know, sometimes uh, a, devel a local development council is composed of uh, over a hundred members. And it will be very difficult to convince that hundred, uh, that over hundred members, just to prepare the the annual or supplemental investment program. So the Joint Memorandum Circular was uh, issued to, pro to to provide for the provisional guidelines. Of course, with the Colatilia, that upon normalization of the situation, the local development council shall still prepare the pertinent uh, annual investment program or supplemental investment program to cover those programs and projects related to COVID-19, which the LGU will fund under its uh, annual budget, or under its supplemental budget, I mean. So it is understood that the said policies or provisional guidelines on the preparation of the AAP shall apply to all changes in the respective 2020 annual budgets of LGUs through supplemental budgets for so on to, to Section 321 and 336 of the Local Government Code of 1991, as we have discussed earlier. So the next part of my presentation is the Bayanihan Grant to Local Government Units. So what are the legal basis for this Bayanihan Grant? Well, we are leaning on the, on the Bayanihan Law, the Bayanihan to Wiresal as one Act or Public Act number 11469. Under Section 4 of this law, uh, the president was uh, authorized to exercise powers that are necessary and proper to carry out the declared national policy. The president shall have the power to adopt the following emergency measures to respond to crisis brought by the pandemic. 
So among the powers granted to the president is the direct to, is to direct the discontinuance of appropriated programs, projects, or activities of any agency of the executive department, including government-owned and controlled corporations in the 2019 and 2020 General Appropriations Act, whether released or unreleased, the allotment for which uh, remain unobligated and uh, utilize the savings generated therefrom, to augment the allocation for any item related to to support operations and response uh, measures. So the, the amounts that may be generated by the government may be used for, for several programs and projects. And this includes the augmentation for the allocations to the local government units. So we, we released the Bayanihan grant to the local government units by virtue of that uh, provision of the law. And the total amount released to the LGUs is around 37.021 billion pesos. So this 37.021 billion pesos is around 25% uh, higher than the local government support fund uh, appropriated under the 2020 GAA. So this is broken down into uh, 12.43 billion for the cities, 18.38 billion for the municipalities, and almost 6.2 billion for the provinces. And the amount uh, released to the local, by the way, the governing guidelines are, are the local budget circular number 125 for the Bayanihan grant to cities and municipalities. And the Bayanihan grant for the provinces was uh, uh, prescribed through local budget circular number 126. The copies of these uh, circulars are downloadable from the DBM website. So the amount of the uh, Bayanihan grant for the cities and municipalities, the amount is equivalent to one month of the 2020 year shares of the local government units. And the Bayanihan grant to provinces is equivalent to one half of the one month era of the provinces. So this uh, Bayanihan grant was released basically to, to boost the capacities of the local government units in immediately responding to the COVID-19 emergency. And this uh, Bayanihan grant has already been released to the local government units. We did not require any document or requirement for the release of the fund. We automatically released this to the local government units upon approval that we received from the Office of the President and upon uh, the issuance of the local budget circulars by the DBM. So these are the specific uh, COVID-19 related programs, projects and activities and expenses that may be implemented by the local government units out of the respective shares. So for the cities and municipalities, you have to take note na magkaiba po yung, yung project menu for the cities and municipalities and the provinces. For the cities and municipalities, these are, are the allowable programs and projects. So it, it includes the procurement of PPEs, for the testing kits, um, medicines and vitamins, hospital equipment and supplies, disinfectants, and other related uh, uh, disinfecting uh, supplies, food, transportation, and accommodation expenses of medical or health workers and other LGU personnel, food assistance and other relief goods for the affected households, expenses for the construction, repair or rental of additional office space building, to accommodate COVID-19 patients, including those under monitoring and uh, investigation. The expenses for the operation of standalone mobile testing laboratories, the expenses for the purchase of rental of tents, spaces for, as temporary shelters for the homeless, uh, expenses for the training of uh, uh, COVID-19 testing and uh, other related trainings, and other necessary COVID-19 related PPAs and expenses that the LGUs may want to implement. So for the provinces, we limited it to two. Number one, to augment the funding requirements for the operation of provincial, district, and other local hospitals operated by the provincial government. And for the, for the maintenance and operation of duly established provincial checkpoints related to COVID-19, such as provision of foods, medicines, and vitamins, PPE, disinfecting supplies, for the for the uh, duly established provincial checkpoints, you may ask me why is there why are why are there two different sets of uh, project menu for the Bayanihan grant to provinces and the Bayanihan grant to cities and municipalities? The the rationale is to is to provide is is to is to is to 
eliminate the possibility of having duplicated programs and projects. So we, we provided two separate uh, project menu for the Bayanian Grant to provinces and uh, on the part of the Bayanian Grant to uh, cities and municipalities. We also prescribe a separate uh, project menu. So the Bayanian Grant shall not be allowed to be used for any form of financial or cash assistance. So we made an emphasis on that, that it cannot be used for uh, a social amelioration type of assistance to the to the constituents of the local government units. Again, the pioneer grant cannot be used for cash or any other financial assistance to the to the constituents. Bawal po yun. For personal for personal services expenditures, including the payment of hazard pay and uh, special risk allowance, administrative expenses, traveling expenses. Registration of participation fees and trainings, administrative office uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and purchase, maintenance, or repair of motor vehicles, and other PPAs that related to COVID-19. So in, we, we made an emphasis on the disallowed uh, expenses that cannot be charged against the, the Bayanian grant. So the utilization of the biennial grant shall be subject to the usual local budgeting process, meaning it should be subject to the passage of a supplemental budget before the local government unit can utilize its allocation from the biennial grant. So for easy monitoring and tracking of the utilization, a special account in the general fund for the biennial grant shall be created through an ordinance by the local Sangonian. So we coordinated this with the Commission on Audit. So we required the creation of a special account in the general fund to easily monitor the utilization and disbursement of the biennial grant received by the local government units. So the creation of the biennial grant may be done by the local Sangonian when they enact the appropriation ordinance authorizing the supplemental budget. So there is no need for a separate ordinance, but they can already lump it in the appropriation ordinance covering the supplemental budget for the biennial grant allocation. So the provisional guidance on the preparation and approval of the annual supplemental annual or supplemental investment programs prescribed under the JMC 02 of DBM and DILG shall also apply to the DGP and BGCM. So the LGUs may also opt not to yet uh, enact a supplemental investment program covering the covering the, the allocation of the biennial grant or utilization of the biennial grant. So the fund may be utilized by the LGUs for the duration of the state of calamity as declared by the president by virtue of proclamation number 929. So the proclamation was issued on March 16, 2020, and it will last for six months unless earlier lifted or extended by the president by virtue of another proclamation. So if the proclamation number 929 will stay, the utilization of the biennial grant will only be until September 16, 2020, because it is patterned after the duration of the state of calamity. So funds which remain unutilized after the lifting of the state of calamity should be reverted to the national treasury by, virtu by, by the recipient local government units. So in case the local government units was not able to fully utilize its allocation, the unutilized portion shall be reverted to the National Treasury. Last uh, Tuesday, we conducted a meeting with the Commission on Audit to prescribe the manner on how the local government units can, re can revert their unutilized shares to the National Treasury. So you can expect the DBM to issue sometime maybe in August or September of this year, maybe in, even in July, uh, to issue the guidelines on how the LGUs can revert their un unutilized share from the biennial grant. So the, the, the utilization and disbursement of the biennial grant shall, of course, comply with the pertinent provisions of the Government Procurement Reform Act, or RE number 9184. So for the posting and reporting requirements, the local government units are required to timely post their utilization. We require them to post on a monthly basis their utilization of the, of the biennial grant for transparency and accountability purposes. And they are also required to report to the DBM, to the Senate, and to the House of Representatives their, their posting of those uh, reports. So you have to send us a notice and we are uh, consolidating all of your reports for submission to the President, for his submission to Congress by in pursuance of the Bayanian law. 
So the responsibility in the implementation of the programs and projects under the Bayanihan grant shall rest upon the local chief executives and other local officials concerned. So we also emphasize that in the guidelines. So the next part of my presentation is the guidelines on the grant of COVID-19 hazard pay and the grant of uh, special risk allowance. So under, under administrative order number uh, 26 and implemented by the DBM through budget circular number 2020-1, the, the government agencies were allowed to, to grant COVID-19 hazard pay to the employees concerned. So the grant of COVID-19 hazard pay to employees or workers in LGUs, including those in the barangays, who physically report for work during the quarantine period and have adopted similar work arrangements as provided under uh, Administrative Order Number 26 shall be determined by the respective sangguniaans depending on the LG's financial capability at rates not exceeding 500 pesos per day per person. But if the LGU have uh, insufficient funds to fully cover the COVID-19 hazard pay at 500 peso rate, it can adopt a lower rate, but a uniform rate to be determined by the, by the local sangguniaan. So these are the conditions on the grant of uh, COVID-19 hazard pay. Number one, the conditions set in item 4.0. So yung pagpasok sa trabaho, yung authority from the, from the uh, supervisors of those employees must be secured among others. So the other, the other conditions are, were prescribed in budget circular number 2020-1. And it should also comply with the PS limitation. So the grant of hazard pay is subject to the PS limitation and GU budgets pursuant to section 325 and 331 of the local government code. And available MOE allotment in the case of COS or contract of service and job order personnel or workers in the LGU. And the grant of COVID-19 hazard pay should be charged against the the available local funds. So for the grant of special risk allowance under our administrative order number 28 and implemented by the DBM through budget circular number 2020-2, the government agencies concerned, including the local government units, were allowed to, to grant COVID-19 special risk allowance to, to public health workers. So the grant of COVID-19 special risk allowance to public health workers in LGUs, including barangay health workers, shall be determined by their respective sangguniaans, depending on the LGU's financial capability, but at rates not exceeding the amount equivalent to a maximum 25% of the monthly basic salary or pay of the workers concerned. And should there be insufficient funds to fully cover the COVID-19 special risk allowance, a lower but uniform rate may be granted for all qualified personnel. So these are the conditions. Similar to the, to the COVID-19 hazard pay, we have prescribed the same requirements for the grant of special risk allowance. Medyo nagkakaiba lang po dun sa specific conditions wherein uh, an employee may be entitled to, to special risk allowance. But it will still be subject to PS limitation and it will be charged against the, the available local government budgets. So the last part of my presentation is the indicative 2021 internal revenue allotment shares of LGUs and the guidelines on the preparation of the 2021 annual budgets of local government units. So the Dep Department of Budget and Management has already issued local budget memorandum number 80, dated May 18, 2020. So the purpose of this local budget memorandum was uh, to inform the local government units of their indicative FY 2021 era shares based on the amounts uh, certified in the Bureau of Internal Revenue on the computation of the shares of local government units of the actual collections collected in three years preceding the year of distribution. So if you are talking about the 2021 era, the BIR certified the actual collections paid in 2018 because under Section 284 of the local government code, the era is computed three years preceding the year of distribution. Is computed based on the collections three years preceding of the preceding the year of distribution. And another purpose is to prescribe the guidelines on the preparation of the 2021 annual budgets of the local government units. So these are the considerations that we made in the allocation and computation of the era shares of the local government units. Number one, the 2015 census of population, which was declared as official for all purposes 
through proclamation number nine one two six nine. And uh, the 2021 master list of land area as certified by the, must, by the Land Management Bureau. So if the Philippine Statistics Authority will be able to finish the 2020 census and the president will, will, will uh, approve the 2020, the 2020 census by virtue of another presidential proclamation, then we will already use that in the computation of the 2021 era. But if we will not be able to receive the approved 2020 census this year, then the era shares of LGS for 2021 will still be computed based on the 2015 census. So for the preparation of the 2021 annual budgets of the local government units, the indicative era shares shall be used as basis. So the amount certified by the Bureau of Internal Revenue is around 695.49 billion pesos, era shares of the local government units. This uh, amount is about 46.57% or 7.18% higher than the 2020 era level. So this is the breakdown of the shares of the local government units. So for the provinces, the 82 provinces, including the MMDA, will receive an amount of 159.96 billion ira, and the 146 cities will receive the same amount. For the municipalities, uh, 1,488 municipalities, they will receive around 236.47 billion pesos. And for the 41,000 plus barangays, they will receive around 139.1 billion pesos. So some of you may ask me, uh, does the 2021 ira already include the, the collections of the Bureau of Customs based on the Supreme Court decision on the Mandanas case? The answer is hindi pa po, uh, because the Mandanas uh, ruling will be implemented starting 2022. So the court, the Supreme Court has already clarified that it should have a prospective application or implementation. So it should be, in, it, it will be in 2022 that we will start implementing the Supreme Court decision on the Mandanas case. So the era shares of local government units in 2021 were still computed based on the national internal revenue taxes. And it did not yet include the collections of the Bureau of Customs, among others. So the priorities in the use of era, of course, the statutory provision of providing the 20% development fund, but we just made an emphasis on the guidelines in the utilization of the 20% development fund. Although we are now working with the ALG on on, on institutionalizing the, the leeway granted to the local government units under Joint Memorandum Circular Number 1 issued this year, uh, which gave the local government units greater leeway and flexibility in responding to the COVID-19 situation. So we are carefully studying the possibility of either expand, expanding further the projects or just prescribing the, the, the negative list and that the LGUs implement programs and projects which they deem is necessary for their respective constituents or in their respective localities. So that is still being studied, but the local government units will be duly consulted by the, by the DBM and the DALG for, for policymaking purposes. So also, we emphasize that, the, that for the LGUs that are still implementing enhanced community quarantine, they, will, they may still do away from, from preparing their respective annual investment program, but with the condition that upon normalization of the situation, they should have already approved or prepared and approved their 2021 annual investment program, which will serve as their basis in their preparation of their 2021 annual budget. So given the uncertainty on when the COVID-19 pandemic will end, we still required the, or encouraged the local government units to provide funds for COVID-19 related programs, projects, and activities as may be necessary. So the specific programs and projects that may be implemented by the local government units or that may be funded by the local government units in their respective 2021 annual budgets should be based on what is actually needed and necessary in coordination with the pertinent uh, agencies of the national government, such as the, the Department of Health and the National Economic and Development Authority when it comes to the adoption of the, 
the uh, recovery plan as as discussed earlier by the by the previous speaker so it will be a very crucial year for the local government units the 2021 annual budget also this it will already start the transition of implementing the supreme court decision on the mandanas case because at the time we expect already various uh, capacity building or capacity programs for local government units in having more 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 resources by virtue of the Mandana's decision, and in turn implementing more services, more devolved services to be further devolved by the pertinent national government agencies to the local government units. I think that's the uh, last portion of my presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, John, for the updates of circulars and uh, administrative orders in relation to finances in the local government units in the national government uh, for the COVID-19 response that is ongoing right now. So we will proceed immediately. We don't need to make uh, to need to do the break anymore. Uh, is that okay uh, to forego with the break? So we yes, can proceed to. So. Uh, the open forum because there are a lot of questions coming from our participants. Uh, uh, are the speakers ready for uh, the questions? So, Attorney Mark and John, uh, we have uh, 30 minutes, but maybe we can extend a little if uh, some questions, you know, need to be answered uh, because these are coming from our participants. Uh, so, let's go first to the first question. Uh, Mark, I think this is for you. Uh, you have already presented this, but I think you need to reiterate some steps in uh, application to the local government. It is a question from Ayan Decano of Ilocosur. What are the steps that will serve as guidance for LGU in the preparation of its recovery plan? Yeah, um, uh, uh, I, I presented the process earlier. We said that we should start with uh, disaster needs assessment particularly with the post-disaster needs assessment, because we have to understand the impacts and effects of uh, COVID-19, especially this is the first time that we're going to prepare a recovery plan for a biological hazard or a biological disaster. So uh, we start with the post-disaster needs assessment. Um, because its, uh, it's scale is uh, nationwide, uh, the, the national government actually is uh, should be the one conducting the post-disaster needs assessment. But I am concerned with the granularity of the needs assessment because I mentioned that the uh, local government units have uh, unique uh, characteristics, uh, spaces. So it, uh, it's uh, highly uh, recommended that the local government units should uh, uh, start with a post-disaster needs assessment. The, the, the guidance from the, the National Economic and Development Authority uh, also suggests instead of a full PDNA, you can uh, conduct a rapid uh, disaster needs assessment uh, instead of a full one. And then the next step would be, of course, the formulation of the rec recovery and rehabilitation program and the uh, approval by the Sangunian of uh, that program. And uh, if it's, uh, it requires funding from the national government, we have to also submit the, the approved, uh, Sangunian, the Sangunian approved uh, program to uh, the higher level uh, disaster risk reduction and management council, as well as to the national disaster risk reduction and management council. And the more important uh, process, of course, is the updating of the investment program. So that uh, that would uh, provide basis for the adjustment in the budget, for example. So that's uh, the, the the process for recovery yeah. and rehabilitation. Thank you, Attorney Mar. So wag yung kakalimutan yung apat, no? Yung four steps on the process that was discussed by attorney Mark is very applicable to the local government units. And there's also a question, I think John, this is already discussed in your PowerPoint, but I think we need to reiterate this one. So would there be a significant change in budgeting rules pertaining to the use or allocation of a development fund in the calamity fund? So uh, with the additional development fund that can be used by the local government units, what are the significant change in budgeting? Yes, uh, actually, even before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we were already studying the possibility of expanding the specific development projects that may be implemented by the local government units in anticipation of the 
uh, impending implementation of the Supreme Court decision on the Mandanas case. So even before the pandemic, as early as last year, we were already uh, contemplating on removing the project menu, but instead uh, prescribed the negative list or the programs and projects that cannot be funded out of the 20% development fund. So this will include, of course, the administrative expenses, which are part of the operating expenses of the local government units. In For, for, for the 2021 budget, I think we will already start uh, to resume the, the initial meetings that we had with the DILG to, to prescribe new, new project menu for, for each type of uh, fund in the LGU, like the 20% development fund. In, in accordance, of course, with the, with the adoption of the new normal, like for the, for the conduct of uh, meetings like this webinar and uh, implementation of social distancing measures and all that. So by the way, the question came from Christopher Fria from Kamagini School. And um, Mark, there's a short question here on what plans can we make this 2020? So well, very short term. Ano daw yung planong pwede natin gawin na yung 2020? So it came from Charlie Garrido of Cavite. Yeah, in, in addition to the recovery and rehabilitation plan, well, of course, you have to, to update your uh, investment plan. So uh, for 2020, uh, because we're in the middle of the year, I don't think we have enough time to prepare for other plans as well. Uh, the, uh, the national government requires, in addition to the comprehensive land use plan and comprehensive development plan, requires local government units to prepare several thematic and sectoral plans. I, I, I notice additional plan uh, required from the LGU with, when it comes to road development, which was uh, the, the, the memorandum circular is still under consideration. So um, in terms of uh, plans, yeah, the more important one would be the recovery and rehabilitation. And it, it will require time from the LGU to, to prepare that. So I think that's the, the more important uh, plan that has to be prepared for 2020. Yeah. Okay. So next question is coming from Eddie Chongson. This is just a question that uh, came John when you were presenting. So why do you charge the training of teachers? This is COVID-19 related. Uh, we need to train teachers for remote learning. So where can you charge that? Can you charge it to the 20% development fund or to the Bayanihan grant? That was in addition to the regular funds of the local government unit. Uh, for the training for teachers, the, we have already uh, conducted a meeting with the, with the Department of Education and the Department of the Interior and Local Government. So we are also revisiting the existing guidelines to expand the project menu, of course, consistent with the authorized programs and projects under the Local Government Code of 1991. The uses of the CEF are provided under the local government code. And since it is uh, an act of Congress, we cannot just expand the uses. So what we will do is to uh, list or include in the, in the allowable list the, the specific programs and projects that fall within the purview of each authorized program or project. Under the local government code, the SEF may be used for the operation and maintenance of schools. So we are now... Uh, uh, studying the possibility of including also COVID-19 related programs and projects for the teachers to, to, to adapt to the new normal, like the, the adoption of online classes and other related mode of uh, teaching. So for the 20% development fund, we are, I, I, I saw one question here raising the possibility of uh, uh, expanding the use of the SEP. So for, for, for the use of the SEP, we are now working with DepEd and the ILG, and we expect the guidelines to be issued very soon. So other than the other than the SEP, the LGU is not prescribed from, from providing trainings to teachers as long as it, uh, it is uh, uh, consistent with the, with the basic uh, principles under the local government code of 1991. Under the local government code of 1991, they can, they can I think they can... Uh, uh, use local funds for the for the training of teachers, but it should not in any way duplicate the trainings being provided already by the Department of Education. Okay, so it, it, it depends on the interpretation. There are ways to do it because the classes will be in August 24 already, right? 
So meron, may, may paraan from the funds that we have right now. Yes, although the Department of Education uh, National has, has funds for that, I think. Okay. So as of now, we will depend on the training from the Department of Education. Yes. As funded yes. by the national government. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. So, uh, Mark, uh, there's a question also from Jose Christian Ona from Lutena City. So where should we start in boosting up again our local economy? Um... In terms of uh, local economic development, it's uh, important to start with, uh, well, I mentioned this during the presentation, with uh, small-scale industries, the barangay, small and micro-scale industries. You know? So uh, they're the ones who are, well, of course, we're saying that uh, everyone's affected by COVID-19, but these uh, barangay, small and micro-scale industries are uh, more adversely affected by the COVID-19 you know, because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, capital in terms of uh, making sure that they'll be able to come up with their respective business continuity plan. So we start with uh, our own uh, industry, small scale industries, and then make sure that we provide an enabling environment so that the value chain, the value chain for these small scale and micro industries is, uh, is very clear and uh, they're uh, provided with incentives as well. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Maria Teresa Areza from Bayugan City, Agusan del Sur. Is availing of loans from government financial institutions a smart decision to finance COVID-19 economic stimulus program, even if the local collection is low below annual budget? If not, what is a doable and workable policy option to consider? So any any one of you can answer this question. Mark or John? But it's uh, financial, no? I so would defer to uh, our authority. <laughs> yeah. So John, I think you can answer this because it's about loan. It's about source of funds. Um, Sir John? Yes, okay. Uh, well, the local government units are, are not proscribed from entering into, into a loan, but the, the Department of Finance has the, the policies for the local government units before they can enter into a loan agreement, specifically the Bureau of Local Government Finance. Uh, they have the specific policies for that. So as long as they comply with the with the policies issued by the Department of Finance, specifically the Bureau of Local Government Finance, and I think uh, the local government units can exhaust all available ways on how to, to provide for funds or like entering into, into loan with the financial institutions. So they are allowed? They can enter into a loan for COVID-19 related response program? Yes, as long as they comply, first to consider is the borrowing capacity of the local government units and the, and the capacity to pay, of course. Because, for example, under the local government code of 1991, they have a limit on how much they can, they can uh, allocate in their budget for the amortization of loan, like the 20% debt cap. So if they, are, if they will not be able to comply with that debt cap, then that, that, that will be one... Uh, one requirement that they may not be able to comply and that may uh, tend the Bureau of Local Government Finance to, to deny the loan that the LGU may want to, to enter. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So there's another question here. Uh, how are you going to cope with pandemic? In what way are you going to engage a plan if this pandemic will last for a long time? So this is coming from Renz Tabien of Cavite. Uh, I think, Mark, this is uh, addressed to you. So in what way are you going to engage in a plan if this pandemic will last for a lifetime? Um, we're not sure when the pandemic would end, but uh, we are proposing on uh, using uh, 
several tools so that we'll be able to continue planning. Before we're not, uh, well, even before we've been doing uh, webinars, but it's not as popular as now. So we, we have been transitioning to uh, the use of uh, digital technology in terms of communicating, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with several uh, demands of our work. So I, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, engaging, that's one of our actually problems in terms of urban planning. Uh, urban planning requires several workshops that have to be conducted so that you'll be able to produce, for example, a comprehensive land use plan. So we're now looking at the possibility of using the internet and the digital, digital technology so that we'll be able to uh, continue uh, the workshops. We, we have tools like the web democracy, um, in, in our Center for Neighborhood Studies, where we're promoting the use of uh, immersive uh, te technology, the virtual, augmented, and mixed reality technology. Uh, so we have a program that is uh, uh, being prepared or uh, yeah, being prepared for, for, for that so that we'll, we'll be able to continue uh, planning with our uh, stakeholders. Uh, but uh, the government has to really invest in uh, uh, digital technology, because in terms of uh, internet speed, for example, we're lagging behind our uh, uh, counterparts in Southeast Asia. So investment in digital technology is required. Uh, we have a law that requires all public areas in the Philippines should have access to Wi-Fi, but it has yet to be implemented. It's because of, of course, the, the, the issue of uh, funding. So that's how I see uh, engaging our uh, stakeholders. We use digital technology. We can even use cell phones. Uh, we have a ch a chat conference, for example, text conference. Uh, in other countries, we do chat conference. We use Twitter. So they, we, we communicate through Twitter. We have a conference using Twitter. So we use the technology for, for planning. So for the needs assessment, there is really a need to invest on ICT. Yes. yes. At this point, which yes. is already a need. Yes, thank you. And uh, John, uh, there's a question from Priscilla Gina Magbuhot from Quezon, Lukban. Ah, no, Gumaka. I'm sorry, it's Gumaka, Quezon. Should the local city executive submit a liquidation of all the cash donations? Yes, that's a basic requirement, not just of the DBM, but of the Commission and Audit. So when we talk about cash donations, uh, usually, uh, it has to be resisted by the treasurer you know, of the local government unit. And by the local what accountant. About, uh, and the accountant. What about the cash donations that are registered, the LTE? How do you treat that? Because it happens sometimes. Well, under, under the local government code, all accounts received by the local government units should be properly accounted for and they, they form part of the general fund of the, of the local government unit. So the, the utilization of those funds should be should be clearly recorded by the by the LGU and the the corresponding report should be prepared by the local officials concerned, including the local chief ex, local chief executive. So even if the cash are donated under the name of the local chief executive, he or she has to uh, put it in the coffers, no, of the treasury. Well, that's a case-to-case -case basis, eh? What if the the one who donated it is a relative of the of the local chief executive, and the donation is a personal personal donation to the personal. to the local chief executive? So it it, it, it is case to case, I think. But okay. if it is intended for the local government unit, and the and the and the and the the uh, Sending it to the local chief executive is just coincidental to his uh, function as the local chief executive. Then that should that there should be a different treatment about that. But if it is personal, then yeah. I, I, I don't I think it. Yeah. Okay. So it's case to case basis. So interpretation na rin yan. And um, next question: uh, Would it be possible to include COVID nineteen recovery plan? for the allocation for counseling to address anxiety and depression during the quarantine period? I think this is for Mark. Well-being, I think you discussed that in your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should emphasize that health is not just about uh, 
physical health. No? Uh, we should consider the more holistic uh, concept of uh, well-being. When we talk about well-being, we talk about uh, physical, mental, uh, emotional, and even spirit spiritual health. No? And that is an important action area actually for recovery and rehabilitation. We, have we should have strategies on how we'll be able to, to promote the health and well-being of our uh, uh, constituents. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's a question from uh, Elmer Fontanilla from Cavite. And next is a question for Jan. Uh, you actually discuss about the monitoring mechanism through website, but uh, I think uh, they want to clarify uh, from Ninita Taasin, uh, graduate students from UP Diliman. So, is there a monitor mechanism for the budget allocated to COVID-19 response? If yes, is the data accessible and where it can be accessed? Can local government units enter? Oh, I think the next question is another question is about loan agreement. You already yes. answered that. Yes. So, the first question na lang. For the for the allocations to to the local government units, yes, we have a monitoring and the the local government units submit to us the notice of posting of the reports in their respective websites on in conspicuous places in the in the local government units jurisdiction. So we consolidate those reports and we monitor them. Uh, part of the guidelines that we intend to issue come August or September of this year is the submission of the complete list of programs and projects implemented by the local government units out of the respective allocations from the Bayanian grant, which will also serve as our basis in determining how much should be reverted by the LGUs to the Treasury. So those reports will tell us if the LGUs were able to fully utilize their allocations and if they utilized it for the intended purposes. So we will do this in, in coordination with the, with the Commission on Audit and perhaps with the Department of the Interior and the Local Government to ensure full transparency and accountability in the use of the funds released to the local government units. For the other funds released by the DBM for COVID-19 related programs and projects like the, like the Department of Health, the SWD and or the other number of government agencies, I'm not actually really familiar with the existing policies because there, there's another bureau handling those. But what I'm sure of is there are established monitoring system because that's a, a, a policy being spearheaded by the Department of Budget and Management jointly with our partner agencies, the government. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there's another question from RV Rodriguez of Santa Rosa, Laguna. What should be the priority investments of LGUs during pandemic towards the recovery period? So any of you can answer that actually. Yeah, um, I, uh, I think I already mentioned that in the presentation. Um, I identified several major action areas. So uh, the major investment, I also mentioned that when I answered the question with regard to how to engage our stakeholders. So the primary investment of the LGU should be focused on uh, providing uh, infrastructure, both uh, physical and soft infrastructure. And this includes the uh, capacity uh, building and capacity enhancement of our uh, uh, local uh, staff and officials. In terms of, for example, we are now in uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, we have to maximize how to, to we have to have to harness and maximize big data. So uh, our local government unit should be able to to uh, provide capacity enhancement and capacity building programs to the local staff in terms of big data science and analytics. Uh, also, in terms of because uh, um, COVID nineteen is a health issue, we should uh, make sure that our uh, uh, health system, health infrastructure is. Uh, very well prepared to another pandemic. Uh, uh, we we stop, we uh, implemented the community quarantine because we know that our health system won't be able to accommodate uh, the number of infections that uh, we have. So we just uh, try to, to to flatten the curve. No? But uh, uh, to to make the communities more resilient, we have to invest more on health uh, infrastructure. Uh, and related to local uh, spatial planning as well. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from Annalyn Flores. Uh, John, I think uh, you're the one who can answer this. So aside from the funding that you mentioned, what are the external funding sources for LGU COVID-19 response? External sources, so uh, beyond the government, 
uh, would you know of external sources that uh, the local government units can tap for their COVID response PPAs? Well, for the national government, what we only have so far is the Bayanihan grant to, to local government units. And given the tight fiscal program of the, of the government brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, we do not have any other pending uh, study or proposal to release additional funds to the local government units. About external funding, are there any international organizations communicating with the national government for grants or actually it's the, it's the it's the department of uh, finance that coordinates with those uh, partner agencies like the world bank asian development yeah. bank and the and the Inter international monetary fund but what they provide to us are not actually funds but technical assistance in most cases yes so this will be part of our next webinar from uh, uh, representative from the Department of Finance. So um, there's another question here. Um, Mark, it's directed to you. Can you suggest, although you're not a legislator, but it's directed to you, so I have to read it to you. Can you suggest relative ordinances to regulate the movement of the community despite the lifting of quarantine guidance? Yeah. Um, we so, have to, yes. We have to be very, very careful when we come up with ordinances that affect the right of the people to travel. Yeah. Because we have a, the Filipinos have constitutional right to travel and they have the freedom Ooh. to select their abode. So uh, we have to be very careful with regard to that. Uh, but in urban planning, we have this concept of physical determinism where we can encourage uh, certain movements. For example, if you would want people to walk, then you provide a uh, an enabling environment for them to, to be able to walk. You, know, you provide infrastructure, you provide physical infrastructure for them to be able to walk. If you would want people to, to, uh, to uh, congregate and, and, and interact with each other, you provide open spaces. So the design of these physical spaces would be able to, in, in, in certain ways, uh, regulate the movement of people. But um, ordinances in relation to uh, movement of people should be crafted very, very carefully. Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, because if the quarantine guidelines are lifted, there's an issue of human rights all the time. So that question came from Marty Bautista from Cavite. And um, there's another question here. I think both of you can answer this. So is the recovery plan a standalone plan? I think Marty can answer that. And should also be adapted, although John, you already explained, no? Or it should, should it be adapted to AIP with a separate budget or from the era and local revenue? So maybe you will just reiterate the presentation that you did. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. With the, the recovery plan is supposed to be part of uh, the, the, the plans that are being prepared by the local government. Even the, the local disaster risk reduction and management plan which contains contingency plans, pre-disaster recovery plan, and post-disaster recovery plan should be integrated and mainstreamed in the two major comprehensive plans of the local government unit. Uh, we, we don't want our local government units to be uh, uh, just focusing on doing and preparing plans. Now, at the moment, the local government units are required to prepare at least 50 plans. Uh, but of course, not all LGUs know that they are, they are to prepare 50 plans. So uh, we don't want a recovery plan to be uh, a standalone plan. Uh, it's better to have a pre-disaster uh, recovery plan. But uh, because this uh, COVID-19 is uh, unique, uh, it's unprecedented, we have, uh, it will now become a, a, a standalone plan because we have to prepare one. And uh, I am, I'm sure that uh, many of the, the local disaster risk reduction and management plans that are now uh, formulated and approved by several local government units ha has have yet to consider uh, virus as a or COVID-19 no, as a biological hazard. For the question of should it be adapted to the IAP, uh, Jan, actually you have already answered this. Yes, we, we made an emphasis in local budget memorandum number 80 that the LGUs are required to align 
their local development plans, their investment programs and budgets to the social and recovery plan that may be adopted and approved by the national government. We always do that every year, that whatever is the plan of the, of the national government, the LGUs should synchronize or harmonize their plan with that national development plan or national plan. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, there's a question from Kristin Marie Miranda from the LG Central Office. So in order for LGUs to have people-centered COVID-19 recovery plans, they should ensure full participation of people. No? So you discussed this a while ago, Mark, uh, participation of people from planning to implementation to analysis and evaluation of policies and programs. Her question is, how should the local government units reach the marginalized? Um, we've been advocating for a participatory planning process uh, uh, in, the, in the School of Urban and Regional Planning, but uh, Yes, I, I, I uh, agree that uh, it's very difficult to actually reach out to the marginalized. No? For, for some, uh, for example, they would rather go to work and uh, earn their uh, living for, today, for the day instead of participating in several workshops. But the, more in, the, the, the strategy that we could uh, use in terms of uh, making sure that this marginalized sector is, uh, is uh, integrated in part of the process is that uh, uh, there are two strategies actually. One is to appeal to their civic duty. You know, uh, that uh, we, uh, we, we uh, educate them and uh, um, make them realize that their participation to the planning process is part of their civic obligation. If that fails, then we appeal to their material interest. But we don't say that uh, we provide uh, material uh, things to this, uh, to this uh, uh, marginalized sector. What we would want to do is to explain to them really, really well that the planning process would redound to their, to their own benefit later on. And so that is appealing to their uh, material interest. But the most important thing that we have to, to make sure that is present is to develop trust between the marginalized mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, the local government unit. No? And that trust development takes time. No? Um, we've experienced so working with uh, with several neighborhoods in, in, in Manila and Batangas, it took us two years you know, to develop the, the relationship and rapport yeah. that we have now with them. Uh, and because of that uh, trust uh, building uh, process, every now and then we can just tell them, oh, we have a, this activity, can you help us? You know? So that's, that's, that's easy. Uh, yeah, trust is very important to be developed between the government and especially the marginalized. Yeah. So that's the inclusive, no? Inclusive mm -hmm. provisions of the law. And um, Jan, uh, in your presentation, uh, you mentioned about financial assistance not allowed in uh, the Bayanian Can you to clarify from you if that is so? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it, it was uh, clearly provided in the in the local budget circulars governing the utilization of the biennial grant, that the allocations of the LGUs cannot be used for financial assistance. We, we provided it explicitly in the negative list in order to avoid the possibility on the part of the local government units of interpreting that it is a part of the other necessary programs, projects, and activities that the LGUs may implement. So in order to avoid the ambiguity, we, we made it clear in the local budget circular that it cannot be used really for financial assistance because the, the national government has already provided financial assistance through the social amelioration program and in the other programs of the other national government agencies. So we tried also to avoid double funding. And not, not double funding, but duplication of... Uh, of, of subsidies to the to the constituents of the local government units. But the local government units, many of the local government units have already allocated out of their available local funds, but not from the buy hand grant to LGUs. Okay, so in addition to the financial assistance that it, it's already in the annual budget, after DBM allowed the use of 20% for COVID-19 response, it means that there can be an allotment of additional budget from the development fund. For financial assistance. 
in the in the for for the guidelines on the on the utilization of the 20% development fund it was not included in the in the negative list and we have already made an opinion jointly with the DILG that it can be used for financial assistance the 20% development fund of the local government units okay so the within the duration of the state of calamity yes cannot be allowed but uh, for the 20% development fund you can use it until the 6 months no yes by the president it started last march 25 Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. So uh, there's another one here. How can LGUs cope with the normal? So I think uh, with the new normal, I'm sorry. So I think, Mark, this is part of your uh, planning presentation. So how can you cope with the new normal? Um, coping with the new normal is difficult. No? But uh, we the, the, the suggestion that I made earlier with regard to... to uh, uh, rehabilitation and recovery planning, I, I provided three uh, key points. One is to use the concept of building back better as our principle for planning. Second is we have to reimagine our local government territory as a system and not just a physical territory, but as a system that is comprised of uh, several components, social, cultural, technological, and even methodological uh, components. No? And third is we have to, to reconceptualize spatial planning. And spatial planning is not just about land use, it is also about lived experiences of, uh, of uh, our uh, um, re uh, stakeholders and residents. That's why we're, for that to, to, to happen, we are advocating for the use of the neighborhood concept in, in, in urban and regional planning. We've been planning cities, municipalities, and provinces but we, 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 we're thinking that the cities, municipalities, and provinces are uh, homogeneous. No? By looking at the neighborhood level, we, we will be able to, to provide a certain degree of granularity in terms of understanding our, our uh, cities, no? our municipalities, our provinces. So then. Yeah, thank you. Um, due to our time limitation, uh, we will be reading the last question, but... Uh, we will forward all the questions to the speakers so they can provide answers of if it's okay with John and Mark. Mm -hmm. And maybe we, you can provide answers to CLRG and then CLRG will forward it to the resource speaker. So this is the last question from board member Sherlyn Makasartia from Cotabato. As local government unit, which depends so much on ERA, how do we sustain our financial resources considering the impact of COVID-19 on our economy? I think, John, that is for you. Yes. Well, looking forward, uh, starting with the 2022 uh, budget cycle, the local government units are expected to have an increase in their respective era shares with the implementation of the Supreme Court decision on the Bandanas case. So by 2022, we expect the local government units to have around 25 to 30% increase in their era. So but other, other than that, I think it is the Bureau of Local Government Finance that can provide uh, assistance to the local government units in the, say, imposition of taxes, fees and charges, and other local revenue generating measures that they, that they may want to implement to, to have more resources in addressing the, the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now come to the integration. Um, it's a very stimulating engagement between the speakers and uh, the participants to the questions. And uh, I think the participants are so passionate in coming up with very good plans that we have those questions and in looking for resources in order to meet the needs of their constituents. And there are important pointers that were provided by our two speakers. So on the part of Mark uh, for the planning process for the recovery plan, so there are two important uh, pointers for the planning process. That Number one, there is a need to prepare plans uh, because it will determine the readiness of the local government units of uh, disasters or um, disasters or any emergency like the pandemic, the COVID-19. So the process is the same. So somebody was asking, are you saying that we're going to change the process of doing the AIP? the PPAs and the executive legislative agenda, uh, that is not the point of uh, Tony Mark. When he thought about rethinking the planning, it means we need to focus on the needs 
uh, that uh, there are a lot of changes. So we need to do the adaptive planning and all those presentations are uh, in the PowerPoint. So they will be given to all participants. And plans are directions which can help us focus on our commitment to serve. So that is uh, number two pointer because there were participants who are saying na bakit pa tayo magpaplano? Hindi natin alam ang mangyayari sa pandemic. But you know, plans are directions. So uh, binibigyan tayo ng uh, daan no? na da tatahaki natin. So it's better to have a plan for recovery although we are not sure where the pandemic will uh, take us. And the sustainability of plan is very important. That's why it's time for us to take into account the data science and analytics that uh, was actually discussed by Attorney Ma to contribute to LGU goals and maybe in congruence to the sustainable development goals that all of us already know. And uh, he also talked about the importance of uh, following the national framework uh, since we have the uh, we have this recovery as one framework of uh, the national government to the NEDA. And actually they are proposing three phases. First would be the response. Number two would be the mitigation. And number three would be the transition to new normal. And on the part of the second speaker, uh, si John, no? uh, Magaspak, uh, it was very important that he was able to show us that uh, the question of the constituents that wala do pondo. Kasi it's always a limited fund and they're saying na walang pondo ang gobyerno, national government, local government. So in its presentation, that is not the case. Uh, we have the new circular, some DBM, we have administrative orders and we have proclamations of the national government. So on top of the disaster risk and reduction management funds of the local governments which are already available, we can now use the development fund. So yan ang difference ngayon. But of course, we have to comply with the rules and regulations uh, prescribed by DBM, by the ILG, and the COA. And uh, in addition also, we have the Bayanihan grant that was offered, that was awarded already. You know? uh, it was already given to the local government units and the computation, because some LGUs are comparing, bakit si LGU A, ganyan nakuha, si LGU B, ganyan. So very clear naman sa presentation kanina ni Jan that the basis is the ERA. No? So for the municipalities in the cities, uh, there was a computation for one month ERA for them and for the provinces, one up month ERA. So yun yung mga additional sources natin. And there was a question also of, do we only depend on the, the national government fund, the grants and the local government fund because funds are always limited. So there was a question of, is there an external funding? Of course, uh, alam naman natin sa local government units yan, ang dami daming nagdo-donate, no? mga volunteers, galing abroad, galing sa mga kababayan natin. But then uh, there was uh, an emphasis no? on uh, the transparency, accountability, and responsibility on the reporting that was presented also. And of course, uh, for good job, and then have always being uh, conducted and being uh, applied by the local government officials. So um, there are three proposals from the participants uh, on what should be the priority programs and projects and activities. And that were also actually agreed by uh, our two speakers. This T would be the ICT. It's about time that we invest on information, community, and technology. Because as what we are doing right now, imagine, before, we are doing seminars and workshops and TLRG. Nakakamiss na ngayon. But, you know, the COVID-19 did not stop us. We are here. We are doing the webinar. And this is happening because of ICT. So it's time to focus on that. Number two, of course, uh, uh, there were five questions on the well-being. No? So well-being of the constituents, it's true. It's happening uh, in our areas. Uh, marami nang nadidepress. Maraming emotionally distressed because of the effect of uh, the COVID-19. So local government units also has to provide no, and invest ways to focus on uh, this well-being of the constituents and also the well-being of the local leaders. And lastly, it was uh, discussed also the importance of uh, agriculture. So uh, food is the most basic need. No? So kung hindi ka kain ng taong bayan, pag kumakalam ng sikmura, marami nang nangyayaring krimen. So uh, as local government officials, it's important that we focus on food 
self-sufficiency. And uh, kanina, nabanggit nga ni Mark is uh, food self-sufficiency. So is agriculture only applicable to the rural areas? Of course not, uh, because we have vertical green revolution happening in some cities like Manila uh, that was already discussed. So uh, these are the important things that uh, we have discussed today. And uh, uh, I'm sure that some of the topics can be uh, rendered in the next webinar because uh, there were suggestions that we also get some representatives from Department of Finance and other departments. And uh, we want to thank our speakers. I learned a lot from you, no? Uh, napakabatang mga experts. Uh, yan ang nakakatuwa because in our uh, new generation, may mga bata tayo talaga that we are really focused on this. We have experts on planning. We have experts on uh, financing. And uh, we thank the CELRD for coming up with this kind of... Uh, uh, webinar with the topic that we have right now and for the participants we want to thank you for um, your participation uh, active engagement and I just want to remind everyone you know, um, we are busy taking good care of others and sometimes we forget that we also need to take care of ourselves we always remind everyone please stay safe no but Minsan, uh, as local leaders uh, we want to leave a legacy and we really want to provide for our constituents and sometimes uh, there are instances that we forget to stay safe. Uh, yan ang huwag natin kakalimutan. Kasi pag nalimutan naman natin yung ating kapakanan bilang local government officials, bilang uh, empleyado, no? uh, baka mamaya wala nang mag-iisip ng tamang plano at ng tamang pamamaraan ng paggastos ng ating mga pondo sa local government unit. So, Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. God bless you. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you, po, Miss Pearl. Thank you, po, kay Sir uh, Mark and Sir John. Um, for this, ano po? Um, yung next po na part ng ating program, a uh, presentation of certificates. So I would like to ask our director, um, Professor Alice Celestino, for the presentation of certificates, po. Uh, Ma'am Alice. Yeah, I, I'm just going to give the closing <laughs> message, I think. Uh, the presentation of certificates, I think, is is that you, Sally? But anyway, um, this I will just read the uh, certificate to be awarded to our participants. So um, first of all, I would like to express our appreciation to attorney Mark Anthony Gamboa for agreeing to serve as one of our resource person for this webinar on uh, planning and financing recovery plans for the LGUs. Thank you so much, Attorney Gamboa, for your um, contribution to this webinar, for your invaluable contribution to this seminar, webinar. And uh, the next one is, of course, our um, next uh, certificate. I would also like to extend our gratitude to Director John Aris Makaspak of DBM uh, for serving as a resource person for this webinar. We hope to see you again in our upcoming webinars. Thank you so much for the very informative presentation that you made on say budgetary guidelines. And uh, this is really helpful for our LGUs. And of course, to our dear Pearl Angeli Pacada, our longtime partner, LGC's yeah, longtime awesome. partner in uh, our uh, in uh, our learning activities. So, uh, director, a uh, director, former vice governor uh, Pearl Pacada was a long-term legislate uh, legislator, and. Uh, he, she was able to moderate this webinar, very interesting okay. webinar, and to add on uh, her insights on the webinar. Thank you so much, there, um, Pearl Pakada, for serving as a moderator and for uh, integrating the webinar for this morning. Okay, we hope again to be with you. <laughs> we hope that you can join us again in our uh, upcoming uh, online learning sessions.
Are there more? And of course, our partner, the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines. Marami pong salamat for collaborating with us. We hope to work with you uh, in the coming years. Although hindi po natuloy yung ating <laughs> Well, a study tour outside the country, pero we still plan to collaborate with you in such a, in this kind of endeavor. So, marami pong salamat sa inyong lahat. And um, in closing, I would like to say that I myself enjoyed so much the seminar. It was very uh, informative and intellectually stimulating. So, on behalf of the Dean of this college, uh, Dean Dan Sagil of the National College of Public Administration. I would like to express again our utmost gratitude to all the participants who I think uh, came all over from all over the country. So thank you so much for joining us, for showing your interest in this webinar. And I'm sure you have learned a lot of things from this webinar. This is just the start of our learning sessions. We will be uh, conducting more of this in the coming months. So uh, expect to hear from us again. And of course, um, this seminar will not be will not become a reality without the hard work of our staff, our uh, hardworking staff led by Sally Hamig. And um, so thank you so much, Sally, for your initiative to conduct this seminar. So as I have said earlier, this is just the start of our uh, collaborative uh, learning process. We will, uh, we will have more of this uh, type of seminars. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us. We've learned a lot of things from this webinar, but how do we apply what we learn from this seminar, especially the planning process? Uh, we should not be content with the traditional ways of learning, as um, Attorney Mark has said. We should learn to be more adaptive, more flexible in our uh, planning. We should be uh, more evidence-based in planning. So gagamitin po natin yung evidence or data in making our recovery plans. And to do that, we also need to improve or upskill the competencies of our planning, local planning staff. Kasi hindi naman overnight na ma-acquire natin yung skill natin sa paggawa ng plano. Like for instance, the use of data, big data in uh, making recovery plans. Kailangan din um, ma-retool o may improve yung competence ng ating local staff in planning as well as in uh, financing. So financing naman, um, well, uh, we can see siguro difficulties kasi government money is not enough so we should explore non-traditional ways of funding. So hindi lang galing sa gobyerno. We should also consider the private sector like ano kaya yung mga partnerships that we can do with the private sector. So we, siguro we should think of a public-private partnership more seriously. So with that, um, I would like again, again and again to thank our partners, stakeholders, and I would like to encourage all of you and everyone concerned to participate in the uh, transition to the new normal to part to help our local government units to transition to the new normal or mas maganda yung term ni mark which is the smart normal so again from the bottom of our hearts we are very grateful for your participation in this webinar thank you everyone and uh, maraming salamat po um director ali celestino um very quickly lang din po, um, this is the certificate um, of participation you will receive after this webinar. Um, so, um, before uh, we end this uh, webinar po, um, I would like to ask everyone to please uh, uh, fill out our online feedback form. Um, yung link po is in the screen. And I will also... Uh, Paste yung link po dun sa chat box so you could visit the link. Um, ito pong yung 
ito um yung mga sasagot lang din po nung um, online feedback form namin yung magbibigyan din po namin ng certificate of participation so please um fill out our feedback form and also we will start preparing your certificates on June 29 um uh, uh, Monday after collecting your responses from the feedback forms um I think um the vice governor Kim Porinpo would like to um give a closing Message is he here, Bob? Vice Governor, if nandito po kayo, para send lang po siguro na message. I think po wala si Vice Gov. Anyway po, um, Ayun po. Maraming salamat po sa pag-attend nitong um, webinar. Um, we look forward to seeing you again in our future um, events and uh, online activities. Again, please fill out our um, online feedback form. And also, please follow us on our, um, our social media sites, um, QPCLRG, um, Facebook, Twitter, and pwede nyo rin pong i-check yung aming website para maging updated po tayo sa mga future na uh, activities ng center. Maraming salamat po.